Good afternoon and welcome. I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Today, the committee will hear an oversight hearing on the threats to Jamaica Bay, a case study of flooding and sea level rise in New York City. Jamaica Bay's future is in severe jeopardy, as 50% of the bay's land surface area of its marshy islands have vanished from 1900 to 2000, and sea levels continue to rise. Further, increased precipitation is, uh, with, with increased uh, precipitation, it is likely that the groundwater table will rise even more in the watershed, resulting in a variety of consequences that could potentially affect the 500,000 people who live in the Jamaica, Jamaica Bay watershed adjoining Jamaica Bay. At a city council hearing on April 12, 2018, the mayor's director of recovery and resiliency testified by the 2050s average temperature is projected to increase between 4.1 to 5.7 degrees Fahrenheit. New York City's annual precipitation is projected to increase between 4 and 11 percent, and sea levels are projected to rise between 11 inches and 21 inches on top of a foot of sea level rise that we've already witnessed since 1900. For New York City's waterfront communities adjoining Jamaica Bay, this is a life-threatening reality. Further, extreme weather events could cost $90 billion in damages by 2050 compared to the $19 billion caused by uh, the catastrophic events of Superstorm Sandy. A recent report by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration, NOAA, finds that by, 20, by, the, by 2100, high tide flooding will occur every other day. That's 182 days a year. And more often, under the intermediate low scenario within the Northeast and Southeast Atlantic, the Eastern and Western Gulf, and the Pacific Islands. Uh, the report also projects that flood frequency along the coast of the Northeast Atlantic will reach, an, on average, about 235 and 365 days uh, per year within 95 to 100 percent of the, from the tides. In the future, we can expect increased flooding in New York City. Incre intro uh, number 628 will require a study that will help identify areas within the city most susceptible to flooding and thereby enable the city and its residents to better prepare for extreme weather events such as flooding. Intro 749 requires the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability in consultation with the Commissioner of Environmental Protection to develop a pilot program for the institutionally used city-owned or subsidized buildings located in the groundwater supply area. Ideally, the pilot be located in a building that already uses electricity to pump groundwater out of its buildings, much like uh, your college or IS-8 in Jamaica. Finally, uh, Intro 750 establishes a Jamaica Bay Task Force to provide recommendations to the Commissioner and the Speaker of the Council on the cleanup of Jamaica Bay, the process by which combined sewer overflows are managed for the Bay, including long-term control plans and the effects of climate change on the Bay. Uh, I had the opportunity to tour uh, the communities with my, my colleague, Councilmember uh, Danique Miller, on Friday. And you know, we saw uh, the groundwater continuing to rise uh, in, in the basements of buildings, of, of our schools, of, our, uh, of your college itself. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing about the radial study as well, uh, and also looking at how we can turn that water into energy. As we're going to pump it out into uh, our sewer systems, how we can utilize that to create energy so we don't have to use as much fossil fuels as well to help uh, decrease uh, the effects of climate change on these communities that are already overburdened. Uh, the pumps uh, as having to be changed every year are, are pretty significant. Um, so with that, I think I want to recognize my colleague, Jimmy Van Bramer, who's not a member of our committee, but we welcome him just the same. And I think uh, at this point, we'll hear from the administration. Uh, before that, I just want to thank our staff, uh, the, our attorney, Samara Swanston, our policy analyst, uh, Nadia Johnson, and our finance analyst, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, as well as my counsel, Nick Wazowski. Samara, if you could swear in the administration. Thank you. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Uh, 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 uh. OK, 
Good afternoon, Chairman Constantides and um, council members and staff. I am Angela Licata, Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability at New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. I'm joined by my colleagues, John McLaughlin, Managing Director of the Office of Ecosystem Services, Green Infrastructure and Research at DEP, and John Lee, Deputy Director for Green Buildings and Energy Efficiency at the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in relation to flooding and sea level rise in New York City, specifically Jamaica Bay and Southeast Queens. In April 2015, Mayor de Blasio released the groundbreaking One New York, the plan for a strong and just One NYC, a strategic, strategic plan for inclusive growth and climate action. One NYC addressed the challenges that we face as a city with growing population and inequality crisis, aging infrastructure, as well as the risks of climate change. Among the climate risks we face today is how we adapt our stewardship of our land, resources, and waterways, which are central to DEP's mission. Last Friday, the city released the One NYC 2018 Progress Report, which shows that since 2015, the city has made significant progress towards One NYC's goals. Today, water quality in New York Harbor is better than it has been in over a century. Habitats are being restored and New Yorkers are able to use our waterways for commerce and recreation. These improvements in New York Harbor water quality are in direct response to the over $12 billion in investment over the last several years to upgrade wastewater treatment plants, sewer systems, combined sewer overflow abatement, green infrastructure, marshland restoration, nutrient removal from wastewater, amongst other initiatives. Jamaica Bay is one of the largest coastal wetland ecosystems in New York State, encompassing 12,000 acres. Jamaica Bay is a beloved network of marsh islands, wetlands, maritime shrub and dune communities, shorelines, and open water. Local Law 71 of 2005 tasks DEP with developing the Jamaica Bay Watershed Protection Plan, a living adaptive management document that evaluates current and future threats to the Bay, as well as the benefits of coordinated research, restoration, and water quality projects. To date, DEP has committed $32 million to 26 individual projects and efforts for ecosystem re uh, restoration, such as the 20,000 square foot oyster bed project at the head of bay in Jamaica Bay, a ribbed mussel water filtration project, eelgrass restoration, algae and sea lettuce harvesting, and marsh island and habitat restorations. In addition to these ecological improvements, DEP completed 534 million in upgrades, mostly related to nitrogen reduction at the Jamaica and 26th Ward wastewater treatment plants. Due to these recent upgrades, nitrogen discharges into Jamaica Bay have declined 43% since the year 2000, from 45,300 45, pounds per day to an estimated approximately 26,000 per day. In addition, upgrades at the Rockaway and Coney Island wastewater treatment plants are projected to be completed by 2020 and 2022, respectively. DEP also has an aggressive water quality sampling program in Jamaica Bay that is serving as a model for the rest of the city. These studies, as well as the water quality sampling and analysis conducted for our long-term control plans, show that the water quality in Jamaica Bay has and will continue to improve dramatically as a result of the critical green and gray investments made by New York City. Since 2010, DEP has committed a little over $1 billion in gray infrastructure projects to mitigate combined sewer overflows throughout the city, which have helped reduce CSOs by an estimated 38% in Jamaica Bay alone since 2007. These projects include sewer cleaning in the 26 Ward Wastewater Treatment Plant drainage area, dredging of the Hendricks Creek Canal, upgrades at the Spring Creek Auxiliary Wastewater Treatment Plant, construction of the Paradigat CSO facility, and construction of high-level storm sewers in Fresh Creek. We have also committed $300 million for green infrastructure projects in neighborhoods that are tributary to Jamaica Bay, such as Brownsville, East New York, and Ozone Park. These green infrastructure projects include rain gardens and city streets and sidewalks, and retrofits of parks, schools, and New York City Housing Authority developments. This June, DEP will submit its Jamaica Bay CSO Long-Term Control Plan, LTCP, 
to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC, for review and approval. The purpose of the LTCP is to identify further appropriate CSO controls or projects necessary to achieve water body specific water quality standards consistent with federal CSO policy and the water quality goals of the Federal Clean Water Act. DEP kicked off the Jamaica Bay Long-Term Control Plan in 2016 and has held multiple stakeholder meetings throughout its development. Just last week, we met with stakeholders to share our proposal, which builds on earlier ecological projects to expand green infrastructure, add an additional 50 acres of wetland or other coastal habitat around the Bay's perimeter, install rib mussels for biological water quality treatment, and evaluate the potential for environmental dredging. We strongly believe that an integrated approach to water quality improvements has a wide variety of benefits, such as additional stormwater management, increased protection against flooding, greater co-benefits for Brooklyn and Queens residents, such as urban heat island mitigation, neighborhood greening, increased adaptation measures for climate resiliency, increased protection from coastal flooding through wetland creation and restoration, improved overall water quality, and increased habitat for wildlife through wetland protection. We are currently scheduling additional stakeholder meetings, and we will work with environmental advocates and the state DEC to refine the scope before we formally submit the plan this June. Clearly, we have many good things happening around Jamaica Bay, and we work closely with local stakeholders. Introduction 750 looks to formalize that engagement by legislating the Jamaica Bay Task Force. As you know, there is a community-led task force that already meets quarterly, and DEP regularly attends these meetings with our colleagues from DEC and the National Park Service. Over the years, we have partnered with many of these advocates and funded projects, such as shoreline cleanups and marsh island restoration that we had mentioned earlier, and we will be working with them on a State of the Bay Symposium this fall. We are more than happy to work with the council and all local stakeholders to find the best way to formalize this task force. Introduction 749 would require a study and pilot program related to open loop geothermal applications in Southeast Queens. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to committee staff, we appreciated the opportunity to speak to committee staff last week to better understand the intent of this bill. The city shares with the council a collective enthusiasm for geothermal energy systems. The geology beneath our feet can be accessed as a clean energy resource. Ground source energy is an essential part of the city's strategy to reach our clean power targets and greenhouse gas reduction goals. The city has already deployed seven geothermal projects across the five boroughs in recent years, and we are eager to measure the performance and results to prove that these systems work as designed. As with any new equipment, there is a need for commissioning at startup and a calibration of these systems in its early days. It is important to note that not every site is favorable for a geothermal project. Feasibility is a function of geologic conditions and waters beneath the project site, the specific energy demands of the building itself, based on how the building is to be used in an understanding of the impacts to the environment from the exchange of heat with the subsurface geology. We share this council's concerns regarding flooding specific to Southeast Queens. Southeast Queens experienced rapid residential and commercial growth from the 1920s through the 1960s, and many of the natural water courses that previously drained the area were paved over by developers exacerbating flooding. The low-lying topography of the area and the enlargement of Kennedy Airport significantly complicated the installment of large storm sewers, making planned work extremely costly. Major projects have been deferred until Mayor de Blasio authorized $1.5 billion over 10 years for the Southeast Queens Flood Mitigation Plan. This has since been increased to $1.9 billion. Together with our partners at the Department of Design and Construction and the Department of Transportation, DEP has developed a four-pronged approach to improve conditions in the area. Construct quick fixes, such as storm sewer extensions, targeting full-size sewers and green infrastructure to bring near-term flooding relief. Build neighborhood sewer projects where there is existing available capacity in the existing sewer system. Create future capacity for further neighborhood sewer projects by investing in large trunk sewers and evaluating opportunities to reduce groundwater flooding. Together, these four approaches are starting to deliver both immediate and long-lasting relief for many residents of Southeast Queens. As required by the Council, 
our latest update on project delivery and an easy to use map were made available online just last month. We do understand, however, that groundwater flooding is still a real challenge for some property owners in this community. In July 2017, Mayor de Blasio announced that the city would conduct a feasibility study for a groundwater drainage project aimed at addressing basement flooding in Southeast Queens. The groundwater table has risen over the last two decades and a number of residential and commercial properties report water rising up through their basement foundations. DEP leadership, leadership has seen this firsthand in institutions like your college, Allen Senior Housing and Carter Community House, where constant pumping is expensive and inconvenient. The study has been measuring how high the groundwater table has risen, assessing how much it should be lowered in order to mitigate the basement flooding, and determining the feasibility of a radio collection plan. Next month, we plan to review these findings of that study with all stakeholders, especially with local council members. We agree that we must continue to study this issue diligently and determine proper next steps to help resolve this issue once and for all. It is still unclear whether the feasibility and costs associated with either the radio collection study or the open loop geothermal application included in this bill will deliver the intended results. For example, use of groundwater in southeast Queens for geothermal would require treatment and technology that could be really expensive and feasibility would be the first step before implementation of a pilot or demonstration project. That said, we want to work very closely with the council and local stakeholders to ensure we get to the preferred solution as quickly and cost effectively as possible. Introduction 628 would require the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency to develop and post publicly a map of areas in the city's most susceptible to increased flooding and a long-term plan for pre preventing or mitigating such increased flooding and its effects in those areas. Hurricane Sandy forced the city to consider the risks associated with coastal flooding. However, as the incidence of extreme weather increases, our city faces another type of flood risk that requires attention. Extreme rainfall can cause urban flooding, also called flash or inland flooding, when storm water surpasses the capacity of our drainage systems and flows over the surface. It can be worsened when it occurs at the same time as coastal flooding. Inland flooding can flood underground infrastructure and basements and physically damage the built environment. In response to these challenges, the city has already begun taking steps to better understand and address urban flooding. One new program led by DEP in partnership with the um, Office of Recovery and Resiliency is a cloudburst management study and pilots. Cloudburst is another name for an intense rainfall event. These cloudburst mitigation efforts offer a new vision for dual drainage in New York City, demonstrating how streets and green spaces can increase the capacity of our drainage system. This work has benefited from a close multi-year partnership with the city of Copenhagen, Denmark, DEP's investments in thousands of rain gardens, as well as green roof incentive programs. Going forward, ORR's climate resilience design guidelines recommend how new city capital projects retain more stormwater on site. Building on this work already done, DEP and ORR have just procured a citywide stormwater resiliency study that we expect to complete by the end of 2018. The purpose of this study is to model urban flooding in the city today and in the future and to determine how interventions can help. The study will develop a citywide model based on climate projections from the New York City Panel on Climate Change to test multiple rainfall scenarios and investigate the impact of changing climate conditions on flood conditions and existing stormwater management practices. These impacts include changes in sea level, groundwater, and the intensity, duration, and frequency of precipitation events. Result from these analyses will include flood maps, high-level analysis of stormwater management options and costs, and a prioritized list of proposed interventions. The 2019-1 NYC update will include results from this study and mitigation strategies for addressing urban flooding. We look forward to working with the Council on aligning our work with the goals presented in Intro 628. Again, these are very important issues and we look forward to collectively solving them with the Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and we're happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, you know, we've been joined by Councilmember Ulrich and Councilmember Kalman Yeager from Brooklyn. Thank you both for being here. <clears throat> so let me begin by asking, how does the Jamaica Bay Watershed Protection Plan take into effect sea level rise, uh, water table rise? So the Jamaica Bay Watershed Protection Plan was the first of its kind, a comprehensive mm -hmm. um, set of strategies to deal with um, a variety of issues that were threatening Jamaica Bay. Um, sea level rise was a study that was done outside of that document, and we have borrowed from the um, Office of uh, Resiliency the um, information that is coming out of the projections from the New York panel on climate change. So there are no specific strategies in the Watershed Protection Plan, which is looking more at the water quality issues and some of the issues associated with transportation and encouraging use of Jamaica Bay, whereas the New York panel on climate change is providing the information that um, is utilized by the planners. But we, we probably should have that all in one document, right? We probably should be working on these things holistically and not in pieces. Yeah, that's a fair point. We're updating that document. I believe it's due this October 2018. So we can include that information as part of that plan so that we have everything in one place. And the task force that we were talking about um, that's currently meets, which does a great job, they used to have, um, uh, formally, they used to be part of uh, the bill um, that DEP, you know, they worked as partnership, and then by force of law, they were dissolved. You know, sort of local law seventy one, they were dissolved. Correct. When I'm trying to think back now, local law seventy one did have a committee that mm -hmm. was established to oversee the preparation of the first watershed protection plan. Then we needed to do an annual update and then that was turned into a biannual update um, and the group was not I don't believe that the legislation required that group to continue meeting after the first installment of the watershed protection plan All right, they still but they've still continued on they could they had they predated right if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken mm -hmm. local law 71 at that time um, we were interacting with that group um, even before the watershed protection plan was initiated I just think it's a good idea for us to continue these partnerships uh, and formalize them, right? And we have, we n we'll have consistent homework that's due. We'll have to look at that homework. We'll have to have a, a real partnership and a commitment on both sides to continue to work with one another, whoever the, the, the mayor, mayoralty is, right? I mean, we all, there'll be a different mayor at a certain point. There'll be different council members. Um, we want to make sure that things we put in place are formalized. Isn't that the best way to sort of go around policy? Yeah, I mean, we are very committed to working with that stakeholder group. John McLaughlin, to my right, is a regular attendee of that um, group. We see those stakeholders um, in, in many instances at our public meetings, so we have quite a lot of interaction, and we would welcome continued interaction with them. And how are we working with uh, the MTA um, when looking at increased flooding anticipated uh, relating to city subways? Yeah, um, I, can you answer that, John? From ORR's perspective, because I mean, South you know, Southeast Queens already has many challenges when it comes to being a transit desert, and you know, as our subways get are, are sort of more under siege when it comes to flooding, how are we dealing with the MTA to sort of come up with long-term plans? Yeah, absolutely. I can't speak on the behalf of the MTA right now, but it is a coordinated effort. There is a major deposit of stormwaters, obviously in the tunnels, and there's a part of an integrated effort to manage our stormwater effectively. But I'm gonna have to get back to you with more specific answer to your question. Because, right, I mean, look at what's going on with the L train and the shutdowns that are anticipated and, and sort of the, uh, uh, the, the chaos that's going, that's going to ensue from that uh, and the impacts, the real impact on communities. We've already seen the uh, impacts in many of these neighborhoods already. Um, so that could be a precursor to flooding in other neighborhoods. And I think getting out in front of it is a good place to start. Uh, how will we address rapid uh, increases in sunny day flooding? Well, that's what we were talking about in terms of our cloudburst planning. Right. Um, we have been studying what is being done both nationally and internationally. Um, we found that Copenhagen, Denmark, 
um, has some very interesting strategies that we are trying to replicate here. We have completed some preliminary planning in response to where we believe there are um, water courses that were filled over time um, to allow for development. How do we um, allow for that water to not necessarily run um, in the same water course because that's, that ship has sailed, but in terms of developing um, a strategy where the land can provide some relief and some storage and slow and uh, detain the water so that the flooding is minimized and attenuated. What about flooding from high tides as well? I mean, there, there will be situations where in the future, as, as sea level rises, where it, the sun will be out, but high tides will uh, be flooding on a, on a, on a semi-daily basis. What are our sort of thoughts on that? And you know, climate change is going to, t to be different, right? I mean, it may just be that much more flooding every day to the, p to the point where communities are going to be under siege, even when it's uh, beautiful outside. All right. Uh, so once again, you know, from uh, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection's perspective, we're responsible for uh, flooding to re alleviate l inland overland flooding. So we're responsible for drainage. That's the best way I could put mm -hmm. that. Um, where our system would be impacted would be if the tides rise and block our sewers from being able to have positive drainage. So that is something that we are studying. That is um, something that we are looking at with respect to where tide gates are appropriate, um, where tide gates uh, can be problematic because they affect the hydraulic grade line. Um, we're, we're studying that as well. So we have a new office that was created within the DEP called the Office of Stormwater Planning. Um, it's under our engineering group, and they are really uh, starting now to initiate a lot of activity around that type of planning for those future uh, sunny day, if you will, um, type of events. I'd love to sort of meet with them and hear what mm -hmm. their thoughts on how we can work forward together. Uh, what resiliency measures are we taking on critical city infrastructure in relation to these types of flooding? And, and in yeah, unfortunately, Suzanne DeRoche was um, supposed to represent the Office of um, Resiliency, mm -hmm. um, and she was ill and she was not able to make it today. John Lee is here, but he's, his specialty is more in the energy side. Um, and green, green buildings. So for some of those questions, we may have to defer and get back to you so that we can have the experts um, attest to the, what yes. their activities are. So I guess the questions I have, they, and either John can answer them or, or we can get an answer, and I, I will want an answer in writing mm -hmm. if that's the case then. Um, you know, what sort of measures are we taking on s critical s uh, city infrastructure uh, in areas like Jamaica Bay in particular? John, do you have anything that you can say now, or I just am I going to wait for a, a letter? <laughs> With all due respect, sir, you'll have to wait. <laughs> and there was no one from ORR they could send in their place. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, again, apologies on behalf of Ms. LaRoche. It was a last minute thing. And uh, uh, respectfully, say that we could not, she could not attend. Um, but we will ha definitely get back to you as being responsible. I, I think the commissioner should give me a call on this. It's, it's unacceptable that this is a committee hearing on resiliency and flooding, and, and I don't have ORR in the room. So they should at least give me a call prior and not just tell me on the stand that they're not going to be attending today. And if there's someone who was sick, which I completely understand, th they could find someone to send. It's, I, I think they have more than one person to work in the office, right? So that, that's just completely ridiculous that I'm sitting here at 1.30 and this is the first I'm hearing that there's no one here from ORR. That's just unacceptable. And, and I completely apologize. And if we can um, provide the answers to these questions, we certainly will follow up in writing and we'll have somebody get back to you as to why there was such yeah. a, a last change. The commissioner should give me a call. All right. All right. Uh, so when it comes to... Uh, my last question, I'll let it move on to some of my colleagues here. Um, how do we, uh, so how does the city define 
vulnerable populations in relation to flooding risk? Flooding risk areas. Do you want to answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I mean, there's a technical understanding of it, which is the mm -hmm. risk exposure, and that's a, you know, a, a waterways management aspect. And so whether it be a storm surge or a flash flood, uh, there's a different risk assessment that comes with that. And so there's a technical vulnerability to that. But we also look at it from a sort of social vulnerability aspect to it, where we intersect uh, understanding of the, uh, the demographic nature of the communities and their wherewithal to be able to invest in the necessary uh, improvements um, the, to build resiliency through that. And so it is a um, the sort of a combination of both a technical scientific understanding as also a social economic understanding to assess a, a vulnerability assessment. And we're working with these communities. We're making consistent reach outs and speaking oh, absolutely, to Absolutely, yes, we are. Okay, I'm gonna actually take two more questions. Um, when it comes to, uh, I took a tour of, of Southeast Queens with uh, Councilman Miller in Jamaica on, on Friday. Uh, one of the things I came to find out is that how much is the permit that your college is being charged for to pump out their water? I don't have that information at my fingertips. Um, is there a reason we're charging your college to pump that water out when we know that it's, it's, it's a city institution? Yeah, that's monies that are being taken away from their mission to educate students. Can we not do that anymore? Uh, well, I would definitely have to go back and talk to my colleague, Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Wastewater, um, sorry, for the Bureau of Water and Sewer Operations. Um, they de have enabling legislation. I'll have to look and see what their rules and regulations are with respect and whether or not that fee could be waived. But I certainly understand your point. Right. I mean, this is something that just seems yeah. like low-lying fruit we can do on behalf of, of our, our city institution that educates young people that that's their mission and it shouldn't be to pay to have their water pumped out when we're trying to resolve that issue and we recognize it's an issue not of their making and uh, you know it, it's just not something we should be doing. Um, so my other question I have, when it comes to the radial um, uh, flooding study, I know that's coming out next month, and we're looking forward to hearing that. What are the possibilities of using uh, an area like your college or, or uh, some of these city institutions um, to do a geothermal pilot? So we very much are interested in the studying the feasibility for something like that. The questions in our mind are, one, um, if we're talking about the upper glacial uh, aquifer, is there a significant heat exchange that is necessary to allow for the cooling heating um, practices? Mm -hmm. um, we would like to study you know, the impacts of utilizing that water in terms of what would be required for pretreatment. The, gr the groundwater um, in this area is um, certainly not pristine, and right. there would probably be um, some level of cleaning that might be required before that. So we would like to study what that would look like, what type of technologies, how much would that cost. So we think of a feasibility study um, would be the right next step. Uh, I agree with you. Um, I'm just curious. I'm, you know, I guess that'll come with the particular plan and where the water's actually going, right? It'll depend on how we need to treat the water and, and, and if it's going into the sewer line, if it's going into Absolutely. the Baisley Pond, there's different treatments that are needed for both, correct? Absolutely, yes. The outlet would determine what type of treatment would be required before we discharge. All right. Uh, at that this juncture, I'll uh, allow myself so to recognize first Councilmember Espinal. Yeah. Councilmember Espinal from Brooklyn has joined us as well, uh, and I'll allow uh, Councilmember Van Bramer to ask some questions, and then Councilmember Ulrich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for having this important hearing and for um, uh, raising these issues once again. Um, a point of personal privilege, I just want to uh, uh, mention that uh, my husband, Dan Hendrick, as many folks know who care about the Bay, uh, wrote not only uh, a book about Jamaica Bay, um, but then went and did himself one better and made a documentary film about Jamaica Bay narrated by Susan Sarandon. So uh, he couldn't be here today, so uh, obviously I had to represent the family. Um, <laughs> and uh, we both cared a great deal about Jamaica Bay. And I have to say, uh, I've learned an awful lot about it. Uh, 
through uh, reading my husband's book and seeing the film about 400 times <laughs> at the various film festivals. Um, and uh, so I just had a couple of questions because uh, the story of Jamaica Bay and the improvements that you've talked about in many ways are the story of uh, people um, organizing and in some ways uh, fighting and demanding these kinds of changes that you talk about, including uh, the nitrogen discharges declining by 43%. And, you know, I know that uh, Councilmember Ulrich's uh, constituents in Broad Channel, in particular the Mundys and Don Ripe, so many incredible folks, have really uh, pushed this movement along. So uh, I wanted to ask all of you, to what extent are you continuing to work with uh, the Mundys and, and Don and all of those folks around the Bay, uh, both in Brooklyn and Queens, who have really uh, led the way and, and obviously in previous administrations uh, even forced you know, the city of New York uh, to do things that maybe they were not going to do, certainly not going to do as quickly as they wound up doing them. So if you could talk a little bit about that uh, interaction and, and, and to the extent that uh, those folks are still influencing your work on this. Certainly. Um, no, absolutely could not agree more that the Mundys, as they're known, and uh, Don Reapy are, are truly unsung hometown heroes. Um, they have been uh, stewards of the Bay. They, they have um, really uh, increased our um, interaction with some of the dynamic systems in Jamaica May, because it's not all about the um, wastewater treatment and water quality impacts associated with treating uh, the city's stormwater and sanitary sewage and what impacts that has, but it's truly a dynamic system that has many variables and forces um, working on that. They were the first to raise um, to, uh, uh, to our um, level uh, the concerns about the Marsh Island losses that were occurring in Jamaica Bay. Um, and once again, John McLaughlin to my right has um, been a, a scientist dedicated to understanding some of those forces and the um, interaction among, among the ecosystems. So we really believe, and I would attribute um, to those good people there in that community, the probably first integrated plan that the city really had with respect to looking at a variety of ways to solve a problem, that we, we couldn't just look at necessarily end of pipe treatment, but that unless we looked at the myriad of um, factors that were being um, you know, uh, really oppressed or were impairments in the Bay, um, we could not solve this problem. So I def definitely believe uh, that they are stakeholders that we need to, to con constantly work with. There are eyes and ears on the Bay, I guess is the best way to put it. I just want to say, you know, we work very closely with Don and, and, and Dan. Um, in Marsh Island Restoration, you know, Dan was, you know, Dan Mundy was part of the advisory committee for the you know, development of the Watershed Protection Plan. We were, you know, work very closely with him. We attend the meetings frequently, not only as a participant, but as a presenter um, of the work we're doing within DEP. They help us with many of the pilot projects that we have in the Bay, such as our <coughs> oyster project, eelgrass. Um, we frequently fund Dan um, and his group in beach cleanups. We've done uh, probably in the last 10 years, um, every summer, uh, fund to help students um, earn some, you know, some income and help clean the bay. Uh, we intend to do that again this summer. So, you know, we work very, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, no, no, that's, no, that's working with the American Little Society. And that's, no, that's Dan's group. Right, right. Um, well, Don Ripe does a great job. Uh, they are so with the nitrogen uh, levels declining and, and some of the other improvements that you uh, outlined uh, because obviously uh, the loss of the of the marshes is not just about uh, the nitrogen you know and there are lots of efforts to, to both reconstruct or rebuild replant and, and and such are you seeing that returning in ways that are indicative of the health of the bay yeah you know since the release of the watershed protection plan about 140 acres of interior Marsh Island have been restored, both with DEP money and you know, Army Corps money and state DEC, as well as volunteer efforts by Dan and Don. Um, they actually um, got 
the community together to help plant two islands, Block Wall and Rulensbar in Jamaica Bay. Um, so that is seeing a great return. We've also invested along the perimeter of the bay. Um, you know, a long time ago, Ottawild Park was restored with you know, wetlands, which is the head of bay. Um, Pennant Mountain Avenue landfills along the bay have been restored to a coastal plant community. Paddigat Basin with an ecology park and restoration of those wetlands. So yes, we are seeing a great return um, and those wetlands are now thriving. Great. Well, I, I'm sure my uh, colleagues have more to say, including Councilmember Ulrich, who uh, represents these fine people. But I'll just close by saying, if you haven't seen Saving Jamaica Bay, it is perhaps the greatest documentary film ever made in the history of the world. Uh, and I hope my husband sees this film. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. Uh, questions from Councilmember Ulrich. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. You are welcome in my district anytime, <laughs> uh, even when you're not welcome in your own. So that's a, <laughs> a private joke we have. Anyway, um, uh, I have a few questions, uh, sort of follow up to uh, Jimmy Van Bramer's line of questioning regarding uh, the uh, the city's engagement with the local stakeholders. Uh, particularly uh, Dan and Dan Mundy, Jr. and Sr., uh, Dan Squared, however you want to refer to them, uh, the repays uh, along with some other people. Are they going to be on the task force, the city's task force? The – maybe I'm a little confused, but they, they currently have a task force. Yeah, they I have their own task force. They have their own the city, task force. because of the local law, uh, 77, is, is – in the process of reconvening <coughs> the city's task force on Jamaica Bay? Is that right? Am I correct? Yeah. The, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the intent of the bill is, but I think what the bill is looking to do is to legislate the task force as an entity that would continue to advise the city. Right. So w will the city be – codifying into law the existing task force that already exists, you know, M Mr. Mundy, Mr. Ripe, the, the folks who have been on the ground and actually, like, advising the city already in an informal capacity? Are they going to be, like, you know, formalized, if you will? I, I don't know. I, I just what – I, what I don't want to see happen is the city set up its own task force or reconvene their own task force with no, you know, involvement or input from the people who have been doing this for free for the past, you know, 20 that's years. That, that's kind of concerning yeah. to me. The city's yeah. very good at doing that, not you personally, but, <laughs> you know, we often set up these commissions and these committees and these studies. We hire a bunch of kids out of college. They're very well-meaning. They, you know, they've never seen it except on a map, and then they come in and tell us what needs to happen, you know, or, or advise the federal government, uh, you know, accordingly with respect to Jamaica Bay. So. You know, what I don't want to see is the local folks sort of poo-pooed or disregarded or, you know, being made to play second fiddle to the city's Jamaica Bay Task Force. We already have a task force. It works exactly. well. They do a great job. It's very nice. The law is great. We're very happy. I want to make sure that the local Jamaica ta Bay Task Force is actually, like, sitting on the city's task force. They should be one and the same. Is that – I mean, Mr. Chair, is that – am I correct in that? I mean, I just want to I, – I think that is the intent of the, the bill that we have before us today right. is to reformalize them and, and make sure that a group that has been meeting and, and has uh, been doing all this great work for such a long time um, has force of law behind them as well. That's great. I, I think that if that's the intent of the law, that's um, – that would be phenomenal, uh, but sometimes – you know, the intent is not always uh, what is executed, and I just want to get that on the record. If the city is going to have a Jamaica Bay Task Force, which I will support, I want to make sure that the people who are already on the Jamaica ta Bay Task Force, including the Mondays and others, are actually members of the city task force. So that's, you know, to the extent that we have control over that, I know is limited, but uh, that's something that we should be very mindful of. They're very, very mm -hmm. protective of the good work and the many years uh, that they have put into saving Jamaica Bay. And and uh, even at a time when the federal government and the city, you know, w w were really not interested in terms of investing hundreds of millions of dollars, they have, you know, shined the spotlight on the plight of this beautiful estuary in the middle of a big urban city 
you know, that competes with federal dollars, like, you know, for Yosemite National Park and all these other federal parks that everybody loves, you know, Gateway gets almost pennies compared to the other federal parks. So now we have an obligation, a moral obligation, as, uh, as people who care about the environment to make sure that, that we give it the attention and the love and the dedication and the, the things that it needs. But, you know, they have been involved for so long, I would just, I don't want to see them sidestepped in any way. So that's, I just want to put that on the record. Mm -hmm. so. No, definitely, Councilman, and I share your deep concerns about that. The other uh, question I had was with respect to the uh, removal of boats that were dumped in the bay over the years. I mean, there were literally hundreds of boats. I know when Emily Lloyd was commissioner, she actually came on a boat ride uh, in Jamaica Bay, and we took her on a tour. I didn't get on the boat for the record, but uh, <laughs> I was happy to see her when she got back to land. But uh, they showed her areas that, you know, historically people were illegally dumping <coughs> boats in the bay, and not only in Queens, but also in Brooklyn, in adjacent to council <coughs> member Mizell's district and in other parts of uh, Jamaica Bay. And the city at one time invested a lot of money in removing those boats. I think it was a joint effort. Uh, they, they contracted out. I think it was sanitation and DEP, respectively, were contracting out with a you know licensed professional company that does this for a living. Uh, but then that money sort of dried up. And I recently had to put $12,000 of my New York City cleanup initiative funding uh, into the Department of Sanitation's budget so they could remove derelict boats in Jamaica Bay which I was happy to do, but to be honest with you, I shouldn't have, I, sh I should not have had to put that money in. Like the city should already be funding that. The, the administration, DEP, sanitation, why did I have to give sanitation $12,000 to remove derelict boats in uh, Hawtree Creek and, uh, you know, uh, parts of Jamaica Bay when the city's patting itself on the back saying we're already doing this? I, I don't know. It just, and I brought this to the mayor's attention personally, and then I, I was, you know, very much appreciative that uh, Commissioner Garcia followed up with me, but not for nothing, DEP should be paying for this. You know, like, why did I have to pay sanitation to hire a contractor to do something that you say you're already doing? Yeah, um, we'll have to look into what the status of the funding is currently, if that's your question. What is the status of the current yeah, funding? Yeah, I want to know how much funding are we directing towards removing uh, abandoned boats in Jamaica Bay? How much funding is actually needed? We don't need a study to tell us that I can you know, ask Dan Monday how many boats are still in the bay. And, uh, and then that's something I think maybe the, the chair and the, the committee would like to know in particular is how many abandoned boats are still left in Jamaica Bay and how much will it cost to get them out of there? And what is the city doing to get them out of there? It's very important, mm -hmm. you know, from an environmental and a safety and a practical perspective. These things, these boats are leaking toxic chemicals in the bay and, you know, it's sort of, defeats the purpose of planting marshes and doing other things when we may have well over 100 boats still, you know, underwater, submerged. And then mm -hmm. when it's low tide, you see them. You actually see the boats sticking out from the, uh, from the shallow areas. So I, I want to get these boats out of there. And, uh, and I know there's a lot of them left, and I want to know what the city is going to do. Is there an action plan? Is there a budget line that maybe we could follow up with the chair and uh, find mm -hmm. out that information? Absolutely. And, and prior to our May... Uh, budget hearing, I think we should probably get a handle on that. Yeah, I definitely think it's a general obligation cost. It would not necessarily mm. be a rate payer um, line item, but we will check into the source of funding. And I paid twelve thousand dollars that I could have used to <laughs> empty litter baskets in my district, or fund supplemental sanitation services, or clean up graffiti and do other things. I paid twelve thousand dollars to get rid of uh, a couple of boats in Jamaica Bay that the city refused to take. Mm -hmm and I should not have had to do that. But I did it because the work needed to get done. Mm -hmm. yep. So I want to find out, and I know the chair is interested in this issue around the budget time, how many boats do we know about, how much does it cost, and how are we removing them? Eric, I'll Council Member Elders, I'll absolutely meet with you about that prior to budget, and we'll, you, we'll definitely discuss it, and I look forward to meeting with DEP as well and the mayor's office to ascertain and, and, and get a handle on what it would cost to get this work done. Uh, maybe they want to add something. You can if you like to. It's fine. No, I was just saying that no, that Don already has. You know, the American Little Society has produced a map um, that we've helped work with them, and, and, and with our beach cleanups and shoreline cleanups, we do um, help remove some of those. You know, that marine debris. So, you know, 
that is that is that is known. Um, Post Sandy had a lot of boats in the bay, but many of those have been removed. Um, there are always new boats that are abandoned, um, but that that number is, I think, much more manageable than it has been in the past. Um, the last question, Chair. I'm sorry. To, I know I'm going oh, over my time. Uh -uh. Yeah, um, um, this is in my right district. Ahead. That's very important to me. What is the level of cooperation between DEP or the city agencies uh, that uh, care for and help, you know, maintain Jamaica Bay, and the National Park Service, our federal partners? I know in the Bloomberg administration they signed this agreement, you know, with you no know, borders, no fences, you know. Uh, I said no responsibility because nobody wanted to accept responsibility for, you know, conditions, safety, cleanliness, uh, you know what was going on at uh, Charles Park in particular and uh, you know some of the other coastal areas along Jamaica Bay that National Parks has jurisdiction over. So w how well do you work with the superintendent at Gateway? Uh, what type of uh, cost sharing programs are we uh, involved with, you know, in terms of actual maintenance of Jamaica Bay or cleanliness of Jamaica Bay? You know, is there a budget line that we are funding that they are also funding or something that they are funding and we are not funding? I mean, you know, I, I have some, I'm very, I was always very curious what that agreement actually meant in, in real life, in, in, in dollars and cents. You know, what are they paying for? What are we paying for? What are they responsible for? What are we responsible for? <coughs> you know, what is, what is being done and what is not being done, you know, with respect to Jamaica Bay? So I don't know if you could shed some light on that. Sure, I, I can begin to shed some light on that. Um, the agencies do coordinate, and we do converse and communicate. Um, that We don't necessarily share funding of particular projects unless it's some um, money that we're putting in towards Marsh Island restoration, which at some points has been money that has been leveraged between the city and the state of New York, mostly for those types of efforts. Um, the National Park Service and the city both do sampling and data collection in Jamaica Bay. So we spend a lot of time um, comparing and doing um, analytics together to look at what the, these data tell us about the state of the bay. Um, we spend a lot of time at these uh, symposiums on Jamaica Bay, um, conferring with each other and our experts and bringing um, shared experiences and shared strategies to the table and to the forefront. Um, so with respect to a more formalized agreement, I think that the former administration's <coughs> agreement has manifested itself more in um, a conservancy, in a park conservancy, um, that's more of a, a private public partnership. Um, I will also say that uh, we had, for the first time several years ago, uh, the uh, Secretary of the Interior visit Jamaica Bay. Um, so I definitely think that that is something that could use uh, some additional, um, you know, highlighting the importance of this local ecosystem to this area, to the National Flyway. It's, it's a major migratory flyover for the Atlantic uh, Seaboard. Mm. So it should be potentially, I think, a little higher on the National Park Service radar with respect to its prominence in the country. The people here at the National Park Service that are working locally do a fantastic job with the resources that they have. That's not my point at all. It's just I would love to see a little bit more national prominence uh, for the Gateway Recreational Area. Well, perhaps the city's uh, lobbyists in Washington should be a little more aggressive with uh, our federal partners to see how we can direct more resources and funding to Jamaica Bay. I just I, I don't see a very aggressive push from the local level, quite frankly, to lobby Washington to do what they need to do to support, you know, the maintenance, the safety, the cleanliness of Jamaica Bay, of the Gateway National Recreation Area as a whole, not just Jamaica Bay in particular. So, yeah, we know it's important. Yeah, we have a nice relationship with the folks on the ground. You know, but this has been going on for decades. It's been ignored and dumped on over many administrations from both parties. And, uh, and I, I just, I would like to see a sense of urgency on the part of the city to light the fire at every level to like 
pump some more money and funding and support for Jamaica Bay, and I don't, I don't see it. I just, I don't see it. We do these cleanups. We, you know, we, we remove a couple of boats. We plant the grass, the marshes. We, you know, we, 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 we like the photo ops, but I, I think there's a lot more that needs to happen in Jamaica Bay, and I just don't see it. I don't see it as, as a priority for the city or the federal government, for that matter. Uh, that's my opinion as the elected official representing Jamaica Bay and the constituents that live in the communities that abut it. So we do some good work. We need to do a lot more. Well, I realize that that last statement wasn't a question, but I'm from the part of New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. We've been spending hundreds of millions of dollars in Jamaica Bay. So I don't think that um, it would be fair to say that the city is not prioritizing Jamaica Bay. I think we have for over a decade, and I think that we're seeing some really dramatic results as a result of that investment. So we feel right. really good about that investment. Yeah. We want to continue to make more investments because we do see the benefits of, of, of that happening. Well, that, that's great, but quite frankly, those are really, uh, th that's restitution funding. The city had caused billions of dollars in damage to Jamaica Bay. So the hundreds of millions that we spend in cleaning it up and, and doing the things that we're doing there is, is sort of like money we owe it. We, we owe that money to Jamaica Bay because of decades of neglect and dumping and things that the city allowed to happen there. So it's, it's not like, you know, we're, we're this benevolent, oh, you know, we're just going to come in and, you know, this is our moral obligation. No. W yes, we do have a moral obligation, but we caused a lot of the damage there. or We allowed the damage and the decay to take place uh, for so long. So, you know, like, thank you, I guess, but, you know, it's, I think, like, they were owed it you know, Jamaica Bay and the communities around Jamaica. We owe it to them to invest this money. We're not doing them a favor. <laughs> you know, we're sort of paying them back for the damage that we did or, or that we allowed to happen. So it's a, just a different way of looking at it. Just a diff two different, it may seem semantical, but, you know, it's just my point of view. The federal government, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they get a D if I'm grading them. The city of New York, B plus. Great job. Keep up the good work. Federal government, D minus. Close to an F. F would be nothing at all. It's pretty close to that. Uh, the federal government definitely needs to do better by uh, the communities that surround Jamaica Bay and, um, and give a little TLC and funding to the uh, facilities that they have control over. I mean, I, I would almost argue that Charles Park in particular and Howard Beach, which is actually in Jamaica Bay, uh, Gateway National Recreation uh, Area, that uh, that would be better if we even transferred it over to the city parks because the the, the state of disrepair that that place is in, we the city would never be able to get away with it. But because it's on federal property, we've just allowed that to uh, completely decay. And that's I mean that's right on the bay. You can't you can't miss it. So uh, that's just one example. But even the level of personnel, we talk about removing the illegal the uh, dumped boats. How about preventing the boats from being dumped in the first place? Like, what is NYPD Harbor Patrol doing? What is DEP doing? What is National Parks doing? Like, how many patrols? When does this happen? Where does it occur the most? What are we doing to prevent dumping from happening? It's nice that we're spending money to remove the debris and the boats that are uh, derelict there, but what are we doing to actually, like, prevent it from happening? I'm just saying this. There's no plan. Everybody does their own little thing. Maybe the task force is a step in the right direction to sort of formalize and bring everybody to the table, but you know I, I haven't seen that coordination yet. I just I haven't seen it. So I don't mean to be a downer. I just I'm there every day. I'm not there for you know Earth Day and then I disappear. I'm there all year round. I talk to people all year round. You know it's very very important to me. I know it's important to the city. It has to be a lot more important to the federal government. But, you know, we've got to get our act together and bring people on board and start communicating and coordinating and investing more money if we're really serious about making Jamaica Bay the jewel that it really can be. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you. Thank you. I have a few more questions. I'm told that someone from ORR is in the room. Yes, please. <laughs> Grab a chair. Grab a chair. I, th I thought you were more MOS, but. <laughs> so this goes back, I guess, to, to our last hearing. Um, if you can state your name for oh the record sir. first. I'm Michael Shake. I'm the Deputy Director of External Affairs for the Climate Policy and Programs team at the Mayor's Office. 
The Climate Policy and Programs team is the Mayor's Office of Recovery Resiliency, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination. I handled external affairs for those three offices. Great. Uh, I, I first thank you owe an apology um, to your colleagues in DEP because you left them on the hook for some tough questions. So, <laughs> thank you for handling. Uh, so I, the first qu the question I asked, I did not get an answer for, um, but I think we have talked about it in the past. But I do want to reiterate it in, in sort of the framework of this um, particular hearing: is what steps is New York City taking to protect our critical infrastructure from sea level rise? Particularly, and, and then sort of that larger question, then sort of a sub question being uh, the infrastructure around Jamaica Bay. Sure. I think I'll, I'll go broad first, and then the yes. question is mm -hmm. Jamaica Bay. I think. Since Sandy, the city has taken some pretty unprecedented steps along with our federal and state partners to protect our critical infrastructure. And that's really what um, the city has focused on in these past five years is our critical infrastructure. And that is, let's talk about schools. Um, a lot of our schools that were damaged during Sandy were back up in record time and have been made more resilient. Um, we've worked really closely with Con Edison and other utilities uh, to invest in hardening um, critical electric infrastructure. For example, um, the 13th Street substation, which went out and left Lower Manhattan in the dark, that has been repaired and hardened and some of its facilities have been raised, so the lights will, will stay on. Um, DEP has made some actually incredible investments over the past five years um, around water, and particularly keeping our, our drinking water safe. The wastewater, the wastewater treatment plants are currently being fortified and the Staten Island siphon, which was uh, went online, um, I believe, climate week of last year. Um, if we just look what happened during hurricanes Irma and Maria, um, w drinking water was a major issue. We have solved a lot. I wouldn't say solved. I'd say we've improved a lot. And some of those big problems that were happening in those uh, in those areas, we've addressed. So I think the city's a lot safer. Our critical infrastructure is a lot safer. Um, since Hurricane Sandy the past five years. Looking at around Jamaica Bay, I think you know there's um, some of the work that's been going on. We have a program called the Ray Shorelines Program, um, which is $100 million of city capital, which has done a couple things. It's done an analysis of our 520 miles of coastline and looked at the most vulnerable spots to sea level rise and, and coastal erosion. Um, and it then has prioritized taking that roughly $100 million and investing it in the most vulnerable spots. There's a few spots in Jamaica Bay that we're looking at right now. Um, I think Norton, Norton Basin is one. Uh, Howard Beach um, is another. Um, I'd have to go back. I have to look at the, the, the exact sites, but Staten Island as well. There's a couple sites in Staten, Staten Island that we're, we're, we're going to be designing for to get at this issue of sea level rise in particular. Um, so that's, that's, that's one program. And then, of course, deferring, I have to defer to my Army Corps colleagues, but they're, getting, they're looking at Jamaica Bay in a pretty significant and substantial way and looking at what they can do to fortify the edges of Jamaica Bay to sea level rise. So as we look at the wastewater treatment plants sure. there, uh, right. what, what is sort of our plan, what, what is going on to harden those uh, institutions? Yeah, so I can talk about that specifically. We did the analysis. Actually, we were starting a prototype um, so looking at an analysis of what would happen if a wastewater treatment plant was flooded um, before Sandy hit. And then once uh, we, uh, you know, experienced Superstorm Sandy, we expanded that analysis to all 14 wastewater treatment plants and 90-something pump stations. And the analysis was really unique because it looked at the preferential pathways for flooding. It looked at the um, facilities uh, sites on an asset by asset basis. So it said which of the assets on a particular site would be vulnerable to flooding, whether it was flooding from precipitation or flooding from um, storm surge. And then we estimated the cost of either elevating equipment or hardening equipment. We looked at the most cost effective practices and then we submitted um, for an available federal grant um, under the Stormwater Mitigation Loan Program, so the SMLP as it's called. And the city is benefiting greatly from having taken the initiative to complete that work in a timely fashion so that we could avail ourselves of the available funding under the grant. So under that, we've already received that grant. That those are monies that already have gone into 
these wastewater treatment plants? It's underway currently. So it's underway currently. Mm -hmm. And as um, looking at, uh, as these institutions could potentially flood, what would be the impact on the Bay um, if these institutions went down? Well, what would, I mean, the worst thing that could happen for a wastewater treatment plant would be to lose the biological systems, right? Because all of our wastewater treatment plants are highly dependent on the biological activity. Um, New York City, through the entire Superstorm Sandy, did not lose any biological systems, whereas the plant directly to our east, Bay Park, I believe, um, in Nassau County, was completely obliterated. I mean, it didn't go back online for a very long time. So New York City's facilities um, were in pretty good shape to begin with. Um, and so that, that would be the greatest threat to them, would be to lose the biological system. Obviously, um, hardwired systems are not mm. a good thing to lose either because they're expensive to replace, but they can be replaced. And as far as I looked at your testimony um, relating to um, the long-term control plan, so it talks about environmental dredging. So how, how, how much uh, are we looking to spend on that dredging? What, what do we get for those dollars? Uh, what improvements would we get? You know, what, 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 where, what would we get for our dollars there? So my understanding is that the dredging is something that is still um, to be analyzed to okay. better understand where the dredging makes the most sense and what the benefits would be. That's sort of this last lingering piece. We do, however, know that we would like to do some surgical dredging for purposes of, and, and John could talk about this a little bit more, setting the appropriate tidal elevations to do some wetland restoration and to do ecological improvements um, in certain locations, in certain tributaries of the bay to allow for um, shellfish or bivalve um, suitability and habitat so that they can do the work of additional water quality purification. All right, at the public meeting held for the LTCP last Tuesday, mm -hmm. you know, as Angela mentioned, the, the location of dredging was left somewhat open, um, that we okay. would work with, you know, still studying it and working with stakeholders to figure out the, the best location for that. Um, then also using uh, bivalves, you know, particularly rib mussels, as a filtration capacity. That's gaining a lot of attention in many watersheds around the country um, as a tool to improve water quality. Um, they filter around 5.4 liters you know, per hour. You, know, you put millions of those um, in the water column. Um, and in fact, the rib mussels are in decline in Jamaica Bay, so adding additional ones uh, would be a great ecological, bene no, ecological benefit as well as know providing water quality benefits is I mean I know that this plan hasn't been released yet but is any chlorination part of the plan here for Jamaica Bay no no okay that's good to hear <laughs> that's good to hear um, and I guess the last th question I'll ask when it comes to how much would it cost to capture um, all of the uh, CSO discharge versus the dredging I don't have that information at my fingertips, but we're north of a billion dollars. I can north, tell you that. North for of a billion dollars. For sure. For sure. Just for Jamaica Bay. Just for Jamaica Bay. And <coughs> the where we would need the benefit the most would be Bergen and Thurston Basins. And that's mm. been part of the struggle here and really um, perplexing because if we would spend that money for additional CSO capture and control, they would be in two of the tributaries where human um, access is is really um, prevented or prohibited in some cases, like where the airport has it completely um, blocked off with a gate. So it would be a lot of money for very limited incremental water quality improvement um, where people cannot um, access and enjoy it. So I'll definitely look forward to continuing to talk with you all on these issues and, and working with my colleagues um, who represent the neighborhoods like Councilmember Elrich and, and Miller and Adams and, and, and Richards, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, Councilmember Van Bramer and his, his husband. <laughs> so, but thank you for your time and, and your testimony. Yeah, you guys good? <laughs> thank you for coming. Next up, yeah. and definitely you guys owe DEP some apologies and, <laughs> and some love. <laughs>
Uh, next up, I'd like to call up Philip Orton, a uh, scientist from the Stevens Institute. Mr. Orton, if you can please uh, begin your testimony, please. Thank you, council members and uh, committee council also for inviting me. Um, I'm Philip Orton. I'm a research professor at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, and I live in uh, Upper East Side, Yorkville, actually, um, close to the flood zone up there during Hurricane Sandy, actually, near 96th Street, where there is flooding. Um, and I'm going to speak on Jamaica Bay flood and water quality hazards and solutions, mostly on flooding, on the problem of storm-driven flooding, tide-driven flooding, and sea level rise. I'm an expert on physical oceanography, coastal engineering, and like I said, I'm a professor at Stevens Institute. Um, so next slide. Um, so my main topics I'll speak to are, um, first I'll talk about core consensus science of the problem in terms of hazards, flooding hazards, sea level rise, and hypoxia. That what I speak to there will represent sort of the consensus. I'm not here representing New York City Panel on Climate Change or the Science and Resilience Institute um, for Jamaica Bay, but it, the, what I'll speak in the first part of my presentation is, is basically um, the consensus um, expectations for sea level rise and coastal flooding and impacts of warm, global warming on water quality. Um, and then I'll sp speak briefly about um, what's occurring with mitigation. I think um, people know about the Corps of Engineers plans and the city plans, but I'll briefly summarize those and I'll also um, talk about some nature-based um, research on nature-based solutions like wetlands for flooding um, that I've been involved with. And, and that's all sort of in the area of consensus science. Then I'll speak, um, I'll separate my own research uh, that's, that's um, not really part of a consensus and I'll have a few slides on my own research on flood protection and water quality improvements. Um, and then some final recommendations, which are also my own uh, recommendations. Next slide. And one more. So the core consensus science, this is a plot uh, on the left um, where I've added three blue bars uh, on the right. The plot on the left is from a, a peer-reviewed paper that was published in 2016, myself as the first author. And it shows the history of New York City flooding. And so Sandy, if you want to put Sandy into perspective and get a sense of what Sandy was in terms of the history, this does it really well. Um, so the bars are just the flood, the peak flood height from each storm. And Sandy was, you know, it caught people by surprise. It wasn't because people were stupid. As it was because Sandy, nothing within four feet of Sandy had happened since 1821. There was no flood anywhere comparable. Um, and so that could be a climate change impact, but so far the New York City Panel on Climate Change consensus is that it's not that that storm came from climate change. It's that it was a lot of bad luck. Um, high tide at the same time of, as the peak, Peak storm surge, very large storm, made the wrong turn. <laughs> Instead of going out to sea, it went in New Jersey. And that can happen, and it could happen again, but it's, um, there's a con you know, based on history alone, it's a low probability event. Um, what's shown on the far right of this plot in blue is the 100-year flood estimated from the, the FEMA study of 2007, which currently governs our flood zones. Um, it's quite a bit lower than Sandy, and the flood zones are smaller than the flooding that Sandy created. Um, and then next to that is the more recent FEMA study, which the city appealed and won um, in their appeal. But it's, it's a flood height for a 100-year return period flood, a 1% chance per year flood that, um, that is being used for, for planning purposes, but not for insurance purposes. So those are the two FEMA studies, um, the first two bars on the right. And then the one to the furthest on the right in that um, panel is my own study, um, peer-reviewed research on the 100-year flood. So those are estimates of what could happen any year, a 1% chance. So you think of 30 years, a 30-year mortgage, it's, it's almost exactly a 30% chance, or, or uh, about a 20% chance in a 30-year mortgage of, of having that flood. So not a real high probability, but significant. You know? And so you can argue whether or not you need protection from the 100-year flood or not, but um, 
Sandy, only by one of those um, studies is estimated to be a 100-year flood. By the other two, it's more like a one in 300-year event, so very rare. And history also suggests that might be the case, since there were only storms back in the 1800s, 17-1800s, that were comparable to Sandy's. Next slide. Um, so this is the sea level rise problem. Uh-oh, <laughs> we had a crash. So I can speak verbally about the sea level rise problem. The New York City Plan on Climate Change um, consensus is that we're looking at um, central estimate uh, in the 2050s of about a foot and a half more sea level rise. Um, and um, high-end estimates, the city's been having the New York City Plan on Climate Change focus more on the high-end estimates, 90th percentiles, to be more conservative. Um, at the 2050s, that's about two and a half feet. So those are the numbers we're looking at. You know, an extra foot. In the past century, there's been about a foot of sea level rise in New York City, mainly because of land subsidence, actually. Um, but we're looking at, by the 2050s, in only 40 years, we're looking at another foot and a half central estimate, maybe two and a half feet. So um, you could try pulling up the PowerPoint that I gave you, too, again. I mean, we've definitely been having uh, data transfer issues. I don't know if it's the memory sticks we're using or, or not. But um, so, so looking out to 2100, we're looking at somewhere between two and six feet, approximately, of sea level rise. So a dramatic. So there's an acceleration. That's really the thing that's most concerning. Um, we can deal with slow sea level rise, and we have for the past century. But to have this acceleration and potentially up to six feet of sea level rise or more um, could be catastrophic for some of these neighborhoods. Here come my slides again. Theoretically. <laughs> All right, so that was sea level rise, and we can move on from that. The next slide will be on flood zones from sea level rise. Um, flood zones for the 100 year flood. Next slide. Um, the 100 year flood is shown in purple, and um, the, its expansion, and that's that FEMA 2014 work. It's not the FEMA 2007 uh, work that, that for which the insurance maps are based on right now. Um, so the 100-year flood as of 2014, FEMA's work is shown in purple. And then its expansion in the 2020s in red, 2050s, 2080s, and uh, all the way out to 2100 are shown. And it really fills up um, the floodplain. Sandy mostly filled up the floodplain of areas that used to be wetlands, low-lying areas, um, landfill, et cetera especially Rockaway Peninsula, obviously. That's um, pretty much covered by water just with Sandy without even considering sea level rise. So that's one angle on the problem is there's these huge, you know, you, if you're unlucky enough to have a 100-year flood, like I said, maybe a 20 percent chance in a 30-year mortgage, then, then this is your flood zones. And they get a lot worse with sea level rise. So it's just like piling on, <laughs> um, you know, concern, concerning information. The next slide shows the um, so something I've mapped for New York City panel on climate change due to New York City's interest, and I was told the interest of this panel is how tidal flooding will change in the coming century. And so this shows the monthly high tide and how it, um, its flood zone grows bigger um, through the century with the 90th percentile estimate, sort of a high-end estimate, conservative estimate of sea level rise. And so these are draft results from New York City panel on climate change, not released yet, um, under review. And it shows um, basically monthly tidal flooding. That, that Billy Sweet's going to speak later, and I think he may raise the issue of, you know, how when you get flooded 20 or 30 times, when you get flooded every month or more, that's what starts to drive giving up land or wanting to give up land. Um, and so that's another important metric of flooding. And, and it's going to evolve to where um, later in the century, places like JFK are being flooded every month. And that's the yellow coloring on JFK in the top, top left, top right there. Um, and places like Rockaway will be flooding by around mid, mid to late century, um, all the areas of Rockaway Peninsula, by monthly tidal flooding. And so that's a severe problem. Um, this, now, this doesn't take into consideration projects like raising shorelines, which was mentioned by um, ORR. It's a city planning project, I believe. These projects can really have a big impact. Th these monthly tidal floods aren't, aren't really high water like Hurricane Sandy. So there's a real benefit to raising shorelines in places where there's no, where the, there's absolutely no protection. And having a few foot high seawall, three foot, four foot high. Um, and so I really encourage that to continue. And, and the city's doing some of that. Um, but a lot of the city's focus has been on worrying about the next Sandy. Um, and I'll come back to that later in my recommendation. Next slide. Um, so the future of dissolved oxygen, I'll just speak briefly about. Um, there, the consensus over the next 50 years on dissolved oxygen, how it's going to change, basically this is one of the number one metrics of water quality. If there's low dissolved oxygen, as there are in some portions of Jamaica Bay, then it's hard for organisms to survive and fish to, to, to live there. 
Um, it's only localized problem, it's generally a localized problem in Jamaica Bay, areas like Grassy Bay that are more stagnant. Um, the consensus is still emerging on how, whether or not that will worsen significantly with global warming. On one hand, sea level rise um, leads to deeper water and it leads to better flushing of Grassy Bay, and that could actually improve the flushing and improve the water quality and the oxygenation of the water. Um, but on the other hand, the warming itself leads to lower solubility of oxygen in the water, so that directly reduces the oxygen in the water. Um, a preliminary finding in a study that I've been a part of um, called the RAND study, um, led by Jordan Fishback and others, and also interacting with uh, Science and Resilience Institute of Jamaica Bay, found that um, the area of the bay that's hypoxic will double by 2065. Mm. So, so that's one study w which suggests that it'll make the hypoxia problem, the oxygen problem, worse. But those are preliminary results. Next slide. And again. So mitigation options, um, in terms of what's happening sort of based on the consensus of the city leaders so far and the Corps of Engineers, um, and, and a lot of community groups who really don't want there to be any chance of another Hurricane Sandy flood, is that they're going to be protected against Hurricane Sandy type flood. Um, and so there's the Corps of Engineers Rockaway Reformulation Study. This plan includes a cross inlet storm surge barrier to stop flooding inside the bay to prevent water from entering the bay. Um, it includes pr protections of Rockaway Peninsula, dunes, groins, beach fill, um, et cetera, high sea walls. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a protection plan, more or less. They'll call it a risk reduction plan, but the goal is to completely protect to at least a, hundred, uh, a Hurricane Sandy type flood. Um, overall, the Corps concluded, and scientists generally do support, that this is the most comprehensive approach to you know, flood risk reduction in the coming 50 or so, maybe even longer years, maybe even century. Um, construction can begin as early as next year. That was the recent news from, um, th that came out. Um, New York City and de Blasio and citizen groups are generally on board with it. I'm not, you know, but I'll talk about opposition in a moment also. An important factor here, though, is that the surge barrier itself is not to be planned to be closed frequently. I'm not sure this is in the reformulation report, but the word was that it would only be closed in extreme events, in a, not during tidal flooding. Um, so if that's true, that's a really important consideration, then it's not really solving the creeping problem of sea level rise, it's solving the extreme storm event problem. And so I'm not sure what the final, you know, I don't think plans are finalized with management of the surge barrier, but that'll be a very important area, um, you know, of guidance, is how they really intend to, to, to use the barrier. I'm pretty sure that the plan is only to use it in more extreme events, like a 10-year return period flood or worse. Um, so a really severe nor'easter flood or, or worse. Um, so, next slide. Um, there are some voices that don't support the barrier plan. Um, I'm not aware of them all and I'm not inter interacting with people, but so I can't speak for that community, but I know one real concern is that the long-term outlook for a surge barrier is that it's not useful if you have your accelerating sea level rise and at some point you need to close it much more frequently to protect people. At that point, you have, there's a political decision to be made are you going to only close it once every 10 years for the extreme flood? Or are you going to close it every week? Or even have it stay closed, you know, maybe a, you know, 80 years out, there may be pressure to keep it closed. And then you may um, have a Jamaica Bay that's a non-tidal saltwater lagoon or a, or a lake instead of having tides and really dramatically changing Jamaica Bay. And I think that's a real serious concern. And I don't think there's strong assurances that that's not going to occur. And of course, always there is the possibility that politics would change over time and that, and that allowing people to be flooded won't be acceptable, and so it will be the, the future of the surge barrier. So that's a, those are some of the concerns. There's a whole, um, there's a whole uh, public comment period for the Rockaway Reformulation Plan, and I'm, and I'm sure there's hundreds more different, you know, opinions on the pro and negative side. I'm not really here to talk a lot about the Rockaway uh, Surge Barrier Plan, however. Next slide. So uh, a lot of people are very interested with Jamaica Bay in seeing nature-based solutions such as wetlands to flooding. And Jamaica Bay is one of the few places I was always inspired to look into that and try to contribute new ideas for that because Jamaica Bay is one of the few parts of the city where the, you don't have the active shipping channels, you don't have um, the port. Uh, there are deep channels, but they're not used very much, only a few times per day by, big, by large ships. Um, so a lot of people, and there's a history of declining wetlands, so maybe we could restore the wetlands and protect people from flooding. Um, unfortunately, in my research and also work by the Corps and for the SIRR study um, that Bloomberg administration had after Sandy, we were always finding that um, the wetlands in Jamaica Bay can't reduce the storm surge levels. Um, 
They can reduce wave heights by breaking waves, but they don't reduce the storm surge levels because those deep, there are deep channels that were dug around the, ex the circumference of the bay that just channel those, those storm surges directly to, to neighborhoods. Um, and the wetlands are in the center of the bay mostly, and so the storm surge will just go around them. So they can be useful for reducing wave heights, and, and some of our, my own research has shown that, cited here, Marsuli et al. And they can also be useful for reducing erosion and enhancing deposition on the wetlands, which could allow the wetlands to survive better. So, so wetlands can promote their own survival, they can reduce erosion, they can reduce waves, which cause impacts during storms. So there are some benefits for storm mitigation and some things that wetlands can do. Um, and then beyond that, of course, there's just many uh, environmental benefits of wetlands I'm not really addressing here. I'm just focused on the hazards. But most people will agree on there being uh, environmental benefits for, for people enjoying wetlands, for ecosystems, for birds, et cetera. Next slide. So my own research, uh, in my own research, I've looked at some things which are somewhat contentious, so I, I definitely want to package this as not being a consensus uh, research area. But I've looked at whether or not you could restore the bathymetry, the water depths in Jamaica Bay, and make it dramatically shallower, and that would be, if that could be useful for reducing flooding. And part of the reason that I was inspired to do that is because I felt like you couldn't restore all the wetlands without having the sediment restored in the bay. The sediment's critical to the wetlands. So that's one thing we can all agree on, is it's good to have enough sediment, sand around the wetlands to help them survive. But there's definitely people who don't want to see Jamaica Bay's deep channels shallowed. Um, so I'll speak, uh, with that caveat, I'll speak about that research. And I'm just going to show this one slide on that work. So we found that it can reduce flooding dramatically. Basically, if you have shallower channels, instead of being 30 to 50 feet deep, these old shipping channels that really aren't used much, if you could shallow them to 20 feet deep, which would allow most ship, most boats, then you can reduce floods such as the 100-year flood, for example, by about 50 percent in its area. So you can't stop flooding with these nature-based solutions. They just add friction to the water. They don't block the water. So it's limited, but it's a somewhat effective. Um, and you can eliminate a 10-year flood today in our present day if you had one of these solutions. Um, and some of this is shown on a website I created um, with Columbia University and Wildlife Conservation Society called adaptmap.info. So you can look at flood maps. You can see if you're in the flood zone present day and the future with sea level rise, and if you're not in the flood zone with some of these flood reduction options. Um, and then the new research, which isn't published yet, which we're working on, is just really exciting that you can also sharply, if you tapered shallow the bay to where gra places like Grassy Bay are no longer deep, and you shallow these deep shipping channels, you can also flush the bay much more actively. And you actually reduce the oxygen problem, which the city's, you know, we already heard the city worries about. The city spends hundreds of millions of dollars on trying to reduce the oxygen problem by building retention basins for CSOs and stuff. So you can, you know, with changing the bathymetry of the bay over the next 50 years or some long period of time, one could reduce the oxygen problems and reduce the flooding problems, but that you can't necessarily solve those problems completely. So it's a nature-based solution and, and it's a new idea um, that's being studied. So um, the, as I mentioned, there's people who uh, aren't supportive of, of changing the deep channels. They're concerned about the striped bass. Um, they're concerned just about changing the bay in a big way. And so. I respect those opinions. And this is just research that, that I've been doing. And I think it points to some real, the fact that there really hasn't been enough research on nature-based solutions in Jamaica Bay for these problems. There really hasn't been. There's been a rush after, after Hurricane Sandy to help people. And, and I just think it would be nice, it would be useful if there's more time given to looking at these other alternative solutions that mimic nature and mimic restoration of the bay. So next slide. Um, so my final recommendations uh, are that a high priority should be on sea level rise adaptation. It's underway with projects like raising shorelines and the Department of City Planning's efforts on changing zoning, allowing for elevation of buildings. Those are all no-brainers that I think everyone ag can agree, agree upon. Um, there's been a very strong focus on protection, protecting against the next Sandy, and I think that may be uh, misguided, or at least it's better if we make sure we get the sea level rise protections in place that are undebatable. Um, the Hurricane Sandy protection, it may be protecting against something that won't happen for a century. Um, and, and it also takes a lot more time to build a, a 15 to 20 foot protection versus uh, protection against high tides and, and nor'easters. So I'd like to see more effort put on the protecting against these more common floods. With respect to the cross inlet storm surge barrier, the city and the Corps should consider, in my opinion, giving more time for A, research on nature-based solutions, 
they can mitigate both floods and hypoxia, and the city is spending a lot of money on both those problems. They should look at them as one um, more holistically, I think. Um, and second, more research and modeling on sediment transport. Sediment transport is a big question mark in a lot of, in, in with the surge barrier protection, with erosion of Rockaway Peninsula during storms. It's a big unknown with regard to the future of the Rockaway Reformulation Plan as well as nature-based solutions. If you want to restore wetlands but they're eroding constantly because you don't have much sediment and you have deep shipping channels that absorb all that sediment, which is what research has shown, then, then you're not going to be able to restore the wetlands and have them naturally survive uh, into the future. And then last point, I, it would, I would like to see there be more outside analysis of the surge barrier solution. I feel like there hasn't been enough, and maybe the, the city or the Corps will correct me, but um, I feel like there ha hasn't been enough analysis into what is the pathway is in 100 years. You know, is there going to be, you know, if there's pressure to, to protect people, will a surge barrier be held closed permanently? And will Jamaica Bay be transformed into more of a lagoon than an estuary? Uh, and that concludes my comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony. You've answered some of my questions already. So uh, I guess how often do we expect the two-foot uh, sunny day flooding in the 2030s under different emission scenarios? Well, if you can go back to the um, about the fourth slide um, that showed Maybe the, the one with yellow on it, a lot of yellow. You went past it. Yeah, that's Next one. There we go. So, you know, there's two stories here with this map. One is that um, you don't see a lot of dark blue. The dark blue is flooding in the 2020s, monthly flooding in the 2020s. There's almost no dark blue. Um, and, and I'm not even mapping today's monthly flooding. There's, there's just very little. It's just some very small areas um, that aren't captured in this map. And you know the ends of streets, et cetera, and some so some localized areas have monthly flooding, or multi, you know, and that means 20 to 30 times per year in total. Um, and even in the 2020s, it's not yet a severe problem. Um, as sea level rise accelerates, it it could become a much more widespread problem. Um, so if you look at Rockaway Peninsula, you see there's some areas that already flood once in a while. Um, that in the 2050s they'll have monthly flooding. And so that, like, to me, this is a map of where you won't be able to live unless you have protection or something, you know. Um, the streets will be impassable 20 times a year, you know. Um, so parts of the Rockaway Peninsula, it hits in the 2050s. Widespread Rockaway Peninsula by the 2080s. Um, Howard Beach is very similar. Um, and then JFK, it's not until around 20, you know, 2080s, 2100 when you start to have that monthly tidal flooding. So it's a good map that kind of gives you the time frame of when, and this is also with the the highest, the high end sea level rise of 90th percentile. So it could be, if it, if anything, it's a little bit of a pessimistic map. All right. And how about infrastructure like schools, nursing homes? We looked at vulnerable communities. Um, will it be safe for them to still reside in, the, in these communities as 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 we move along into uh, later on in, into the de into the century? I, I encourage you to, to look to the RAND study that I mentioned. Um, we can point you to that afterward. It's, it's a study about Jamaica Bay um, that's interacting with the Science and Resilience mm -hmm. Institute in New York City. Um, um, and they, they have an analysis of buildings um, that are in harm's way over time into the future. Um, I would say that if you're, in the, if you're in these areas that would flood monthly, then that's a severe problem for running a school. Um, even if it's elevated, you'd have to elevate the roads or else there'll be transportation problems. Um, so it really becomes impassable at that at these stages in the future when you have monthly flooding. So by twenty by twenty thirties, some of these communities and really by the twenty eighties, twenty nineties, we're talking about just complete and utter many, many communities by the latter part of the century, yes. Yeah. And it, this is at the high end sea level rise estimate. If it's a median sea level rise estimate, you still have two or three feet of sea level rise. And so it'd still be, you know, a lot of Rockaway Peninsula will have a severe problem. The lowest lying areas within the century are guarant almost guaranteed to have um, encroaching monthly flooding by the latter part of the century. Do you think we're going far enough as a city to sort of stave off some of these effects? The Raising Shorelines project's a great way to, to stave off the tidal flooding, I think, it, um, and, and nor'easter flooding, et cetera. It won't stop Hurricane Sandy level flooding. So I think this, and, and there's a lot of effort in city planning, um, and I meet with them, you know, at least once a year just to talk to them about what they're doing and try to be helpful. Um, and I'm always impressed with what city planning is doing. But it's, it's challenging to change a city, you know, to change the zoning. Um, it's challenging 
to raise buildings that are concrete or, or brick, um, big challenge, <laughs> impossible. So um, if sea level rise happens slowly enough, then I'm optimistic that we can just be evolving the city as we rebuild things, but it's still going to be more, it's still, there still will be an expense. Um, yeah. Thank you. I want to recognize that we're joined by Councilmember Donovan Richards and Councilmember Adrian Adams, both from Queens, and uh, Donovan Richards, Councilmember Richards has some questions for you as well. Thank you uh, for this uh, intense study, and uh, I represent the Rockaways, so okay. thank you. <laughs> um, and I wanted to be sure you are aware of several things going on as well. So I think these areas that are reflected here in blue are Edgemere, so we ha obviously have a lot of Ray Shoreline projects coming Great. online. Uh, I think $145 million commitment from the mayor on at least Edgemere. Well, $400 million plan, actually, eventually, that will come into fruition. And then um, we're actually doing a drainage study now, which the city is, is actually in the process of completing now, and something the federal government also recognized, you know, in this community um, is we need to push uh, homeowners inland more so and build out features along the shoreline so we're actually relocating families further inland as much as we can without eminent domain or anything of that nature um, to ensure that we can build protective barriers uh, at least in Edgemere um, right now. I wanted to know, I had a, a few questions for you. Um, so should we be building in Rockaway? I, I, or should we build in these communities? And that's the question that I'm always tasked at asking uh, or being asked at least by the community. Um, so do you see a conflict between building efforts and resiliency, or I just wanted to get sort of your opinion on that? It's going to be an opinion because th that's a really <laughs> tough problem. Um, one side of me, and I can give both opinions, uh -huh. both sides. Uh -huh. You know, people sometimes say, I can't believe they're still, they're building up the flood zones around the city with high rises and all this. And I, I think you can, um, you know, the ferry system was the most resilient transportation during Hurricane Sandy. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's a reasonable argument that if you build things that are meant for water and, or just plan for the, what's going to happen, maybe they're more elevated, mm -hmm. um, then you can still have a city um, that's resilient to water. You can allow water into certain places, but as long mm -hmm. as it's not going to the places where people are living, then it might be acceptable. So you can, maybe with innovation, we can, we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, Rockaway Peninsula, is, on the other hand, it's, um, I, I really support having buyout funds that are available and give people a good deal if they get flooded instead of having to wait a year or two like some of the programs that we've had. New York State's buyout program was just getting set up, and so yeah. it really was not a great mm -hmm. deal for people. And there were people who actually said they would have taken a buyout in some, some places, not as much Rockaway. People really want to be there. Um, but in some places, people wanted something like that, but it wasn't. They didn't like the deal, and they didn't take it. Um, so having good buyout programs is useful, so that people are in flood zones only if they want to be there. If people want to be there, and they probably will want to be there in a hundred years on Rockaway still, because it's a great place to be, um, then then maybe there. You know, we need innovative thinking, and we need to plan for these projections of sea level rise. And if you had to give, I know you gave a series of recommendations. Um, so to deal with tidal flooding, what would be your number one priority if you were sitting in the seat? Uh, to protecting against it? Yeah. The raising shorelines type projects. I think those are great. Um, maybe also another serious issue will be uh, stormwater drainage. And yeah. As mentioned so earlier no today. There's no infrastructure in a lot of places. Yeah, you know. Just finally getting there. New York City is, I mean, uh, New Orleans is largely below sea level. New York mm -hmm. City is nothing like that. We have elevation. Mm -hmm. In every neighborhood, we're well above sea level. You know, maybe you know above high tides, a few places not by much. Um, so it's a pumps are what New Orleans uses for everything. So pumping systems, it's not green at all. I don't love the concept, but from your perspective, when you have constituents, then pumps are very important. In a place like Hoboken, where I work, pumps are very important. Jersey City, Hoboken, and I presume parts of New York City. Um, and improving, coming up with green infrastructure ways to have the rainwater pile up over there, and the homes will be over here. You know. Smart green and en green engineering ideas can help a lot too. Thank you. And uh, yep. where can I find a copy of this report? Uh, I'm gonna. I'll write up the com the my comment. Try to capture what I said. Okay. And a copy of your report. Okay. The PowerPoint. Your PowerPoint. Yep. I'm sorry. I'll I'll include that at, at the back. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Richards. 
All right, thank you for your testimony. We appreciate your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we we'll have uh, John, uh, John uh, Rainer, uh, Reiner, sorry, to step forward, and Paul Mankiewicz. Mankiewicz. <coughs> All right, so Mike DeLong and Catherine uh, McVeigh Hughes as well. Oh, All right, I great. Well, if we can start there on the right. Okay. <coughs> Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for um, uh, this opportunity to present to you. Uh, my name is John Reiner. I'm with uh, PW Grocer Consulting. I'm the uh, uh, vice president for the geothermal services at the firm. I've been with the firm about 10 years. Um, <coughs> I've had the priv privilege to um, speak before uh, the committee previously on the two geothermal local laws uh, that were passed um, in 2013-2016. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here again today. Um, <clears throat> I've, um, my background is I'm a, a practicing hydrogeologist. I've worked on Long Island and New York City for about 33 years in that capacity, environmental consulting, hydrogeologic consulting and the likes. Um, last 15 years, I've been working as a, a geothermal consultant in New York City and Long Island. Um, so I have good familiarity with the Long Island's geology, the city's geology, um, and the Brooklyn Queens Aquifer, which is the subject of, of, of this local law regarding the pilot program. Um, my firm, uh, we've done a lot of work in the city. Um, personally and with my firm, we've We've worked with the New York City Department of Design and Construction. Uh, I was co-author uh, with the DDC, Alex Posner, for the Geothermal Heat Pump Manual, which was published in 2013. And I've worked on several projects with the DDC geothermal projects in the city. And my firm also, we designed the wells for the St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is now fully heated and cooled, the entire block that St. Patrick's Cathedral sits on as well as uh, the, the new Bloomberg Center for uh, Roosevelt Island for the Cornell New York City uh, Tech Project. Um, so um, the subject of this, um, this intro, we're fully in support of it to somehow study and look at the viability of using the shallow groundwater from the Brooklyn Queens Aquifer for heating and cooling uh, purposes. Um, that's one type of geothermal system you could use. It's called an open loop system. You use the groundwater um, from wherever you get it from, wells or, or um, basement sump pumps in this case, if you're actually pumping up the water to keep your basements dry. Uh, you run it through mechanical equipment, exchange heat with it, and then you have to put it someplace when, it, when you're done with it. It's either hotter or colder. Um, Typically, with an open loop system, you're, you're pumping from um, wells, you use the water, and then you discharge it back into separate wells that are at some distance away because water is going to be hotter or colder. You don't want to reuse that water, so you, you want to rely on the ambient temperature water. Um, w one, thing, um, one thing with these geothermal systems are that they're, it's pretty well documented that they're more expensive than a conventional HVAC system. They're very energy efficient. They're all electric. They allow you to eliminate fossil fuel heating systems. They can heat and cool, all electric devices. Um, but they are more expensive than conventional systems owing to the drilling, that part of it. So the premise of this intro is that there is 
um, groundwater being pumped throughout the Brooklyn Queens area to mitigate flooding. I, ass I assume that's the case. It doesn't it's discreetly say that in the bill, but there is pumping going on to keep basements dry and the water is going to the sewer. That's, that's the premise. So um, to use that water beneficially for heating and cooling would be a wonderful thing. It would be, it's very unfortunate that that water just gets discharged into the sewer. So w we're all in favor of that. How it actually happens is it's easier said than done. Um, um, but we are, we are in support of it. I've done, um, personally and my firm, we've done several studies within the Brooklyn, Queens area where we've documented this rebound of the water table. Um, I'm, I'm in pr private consulting. We have clients, and for, for instance, uh, I, I did a study at York College too. So we, we were able to demonstrate with uh, historic water level data from the USGS that the water levels are rebounding and that's basically, essentially because the city has stopped pumping the groundwater. I think that's a, a, a that's demonstrated knowledge as well. But be, be that as it may, um, it's creating, created a lot of flooding in different areas. Um, so let me, let me say, um, the aspect of using this water, it reduces the first cost of geothermal systems because you don't have to install the wells. It eliminates that, that first cost of installing the wells. The infrastructure is already in place, whether it's from sump pumps or other, other devices pumping this water up. So uh, basically by wa more widespread adoption of this practice, using this pumped water that's being uh, pumped for to mitigate flooding for geothermal, it will allow for more widespread adoption of geothermal systems. Uh, more buildings can get off fossil fuel and um, we can kind of uh, accelerate the city's um, desires to make geothermal heating and cooling more part of the mainstream uh, HVAC system in the city. Basically, uh, all electric heat pump systems, and these are ground source heat pump systems. Um, let's see. Okay, so I just wanted to bring to your attention, I'm sorry I don't have any written testimony, but I'll, I'll get some to you. I'm encouraged that the DEP is looking at the issue of uh, mitigating the flooding because of this rebounding effect. Um, several years ago, we met with um, Congressman Scarborough about that, what kind of studies can be done. So it's, uh, it's very encouraging to see the DEP and the city moving forward. I know there was some, um, they were looking at a passive groundwater drainage system for a while. So two things I wanted to bring to your attention, and I think you alluded to the MTA. What is the MTA doing about this? Um, you may or may not be aware of the New York City Transit Authority did a very comprehensive feasibility study, and don't, don't quote me, but I think it was the Archer Avenue subway system and the Pitkin Avenue subway system, and I can send you copies of that if you'd like. Both of those subway systems have permanent well pumping around them to keep the, the, the subways dry. And that water is being directly pumped into the stormwater system and that runs to Jamaica Bay. Um, so they did a study where they actually looked at what can we do with this water. It's uh, along on the order of 10 to 11 million gallons per day. What can we do this with, with this water? They looked at um, end users along the pipe routing to Jamaica Bay, different types of end users, all sorts of beneficial reuse, geothermal, uh, you know, truck car washing, uh, cooling tower, blow down um, water for evaporative cooling tower. So I just wanted to make you aware of that, that that study exists, um, and it's an excellent study. Um, and I guess regarding the bill, I would say the, the, it shouldn't focus just on buildings that are pumping to use to use that water for heating and cooling in that building. There are other sources of the water that um, you know another city facility could tap into this MTA water. That's my thought. And there also could be two facilities next to each other that this one's pumping to relieve drain uh, flooding. This one doesn't have issues with flooding, but maybe this building could use the water 
because the mechanical system can't be retrofitted for this one. So let's share the water across property lines and let's perhaps look into tapping into the MTA's free water. Ten years ago, they called it free water. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next, sir. The Sergeant Arms can take uh, testimony. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very impressed with the model you got to present the material. I'm I've been at this for a fair amount of time. I'm Paul Manquist. I have a doctor in, doctorate in uh, develop, developmental biology. I'm the founding board member of the Soil and Water Conservation District, the uh, founder of the Urban Soil Institute, run something called the Guy Institute in New York City, and I'm a professor of Pratt Institute. I have built a fair amount in New York City, and I, in 1989 and starting in 1990, was a expert witness for Bobby Kennedy, who was basically suing the city uh, over the Pelham Bay landfill and illegal discharges. Um, after that process, it was fairly clear exactly what you're seeing today uh, was true then. Um, let me say that in another way. In 1990, I was president of the Troy Botanical Society, and Senator Al Gore had all the presidents of the American Geophysical Union, all the biological and ecological groups, and he said, he looked at the global warming and sea level rise, rise, and he said, you all know this is happening. What can we do to make something happen about it? So this meeting is extremely encouraging because this is something that we can literally do to have some impact on a number of ways, both on shoreline protection and the rest. The initial opportunity I just want to talk about is we make about 2,500 tons a day of glass aggregate, recycled glass, SIMS does it. And on the little handout there it shows if you were to build, and I have built many in New York, about the first 20 or so for New York City, the first dozen for DEP in the Jamaica Bay watershed, a basically between a little every square foot of sidewalk or roadway or parking lot, if you had two feet of this glass, you would hold one foot of flood water. It wouldn't go away, it would store it literally and then it would seep out back into the estuary afterwards. And the expense of this, we have this in our hands. We also have a huge multiple of that, something like 19,500 tons per day of waste glass, concrete, um, and also uh, brick. I'm telling you this because uh, that's an opportunity. Dan Walsh runs the uh, Mayor's Office for Remediation. They pull out of the ground every year 100,000 cubic yards of sand that is so clean that literally it passes all environmental tests. It's enough sand to make a dune about 20 feet high and 10 feet long every year. So it's true we need to protect the coastline. We have materials that literally could be creating habitat for piping plover, for least tern, for black skimmer, dune grasses, and also protecting the people with exactly what was here before. It would take some creativity, but in the city that actually produced the first great watershed, the first great infrastructure, uh, we could probably do this. But I'm saying that we have literally an opportunity in what passes through our hands. All ecological systems work by turning waste into resources. Taking um, the 11 million gallons of my colleague here, that if apple transpired from either street side plantings or green roofs or green walls, is worth about $7 million a day in cooling. I have a green roof in Red Hook, New York, and he says it's 12,000 square foot building. He says 40% of his air conditioning and about 24% of his heating. Water, I'd love the other use as well. Just it's got water is the thermal regulator of planet Earth. So the, in front of us, we have to do something about sea level rise. The incremental change is not a problem. It's already passing through our hands. We have this immense amount of material. One could also build actually deeper stormwater capture systems and use them as heat sinks and sources, just as described in the previous presentation. It's just an opportunity, and you can look at it piecemeal or integrate it, just as, as you've heard just now. So I'm going to vote for integrating, and I think, um, thank God the City Council has taken this interest because we could make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ray Hughes. Hi. Uh, nice to see you again. Yes, I, I apologize, you, I I apologize mean, for not being there Wednesday. I was a little under the weather. So. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, 
but we would love to get uh, you to our next meeting. A date has to be determined for the Storm Surge Barrier Working Group, but we'd also love for you uh, if we could make a presentation for you and your colleagues or even have a hearing on it because right now the U.S. Army Corps is looking at five different options. And as you know, option two is um, the st regional storm surge barrier. So since last Tuesday when I testified, I actually now have a copy of the article that was referenced, the environmental law in New York. Um, I will be submitting this. I only have one copy because it's a color printout. Um, and it's the social justice case for a metropolitan New York, New Jersey regional storm surge barrier um, by Dr. Malcolm J. Bowman, uh, William Golden, uh, myself, Dr. Christopher Sellers, and Robert Yarrow. So I just wanted to point this out. I'll be submitting this officially to the record. Um, in addition, there are two copies in the green folder. Um, we ran out of newsletter one and newsletter two. And the conference briefing, we had an all-day conference on May 18th, uh, a year ago, on protecting New York and New Jersey um, from future storm surges. So what I'm going to be doing today is just reading the note from the chair of the storm surge barrier working group. We are advocates for a layered defense system encompassing both an offshore regional barrier system and a network of onshore perimeter defenses that would be developed together by the New York City and all the coastal communities surrounding the 1,000 miles of shoreline of New York Harbor, its tributaries, and the lower Hudson River. This specifically separates the function of the regional barriers designed to hold back dangerous storm surges from future megastorms, but not the slow but insidious rise in sea level. Regional storm surge barriers must be held open 99.99% of the time for the purposes of the navigation, fish migration, fisheries, tidal currents, river discharges, harbor flushing. There's no way they can hold back sea level rise. This then shifts the responsibility of protecting the city and other perimeter harbor tributary hat communities in New York New and New Jersey from sea level rise through the construction of modest seawalls, abutments, and barrier beach renourishment projects in a grand partnership. We don't oppose the city's proposal to build more than 100 perimeter barriers for its 520 miles of coastal shoreline. We want to partner with them to protect the city and region from both damaging storm surges and sea level rise. We believe this system of layered defense can protect the whole metropolitan region for more than a century into the future. Only in this way can the essential tasks of protection against both storm surges and sea level rise be accommodated in an advantageous cost benefit scenario plus gain the support of the metropolitan residents who will not accept 20 foot high walls built around their iconic shoreline, views of New York City, Hoboken, Port Elizabeth, Jersey City, and other coastal communities and infrastructure. Um, what I also want to say is um, I know this committee is not focused on what causes greenhouse gas emissions, but I did present at last week's hearing a uh, chart, I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me, that there has not, it has been a level off for the last five years of public data. So your committee you know, is at the crossroads of, you know, trying to limit that and also to protect our incredible neighborhood. And congratulations on your city and state profile that just came out. Thank Chair you. Chair thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Constantinides and members of the council. My name is Mike Dulong. I'm a staff attorney with Hudson River Keeper. We're a nonprofit watchdog organization dedicated to defending the Hudson River and all its tributaries and to protecting the drinking water supply of nine million New York City and Hudson Valley residents. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We're thrilled by this committee's attention to Jamaica Bay. Um, I've provided copies of my testimony. I'm not gonna read it, uh, just give you the leads. Um, we support intro 750. Um, the task force proposing the bill we think could help bring additional city council oversight to Jamaica Bay and to water quality and resiliency issues. Um, and there's a lot going on down there right now. Uh, as you heard, there is the Army Corps proposal for a $3.7 billion storm surge barrier. Um, we are still concerned that there has not been a story, uh, um, research done on how the barrier might choke the bay. And that research has to get done. We think this committee and the council could help make sure, help ensure that the Army Corps does that before anything, any decisions are made. 
um, with that tremendous amount of resources. Um, and DEP is also working through plans for stormwater, both in the separate sewer district, there's a stormwater management plan out right now in draft, and in the CSO part, um, which I think makes up about 31% of the drainage area that comes into the bay, uh, there is the long-term control plan. Both of these are out right now, so there is some time pressure to getting this done. The comments would be due on May 15th for the long-term control plan for the CSOs, combined sewers, and May 15th for the stormwater management plan. Um, and we expect for that Army Corps proposal, we expect to see a, another one, um, a modified proposal sometime towards the end of the summer. Um, so that said, we want this task force. We think it would be great. Um, but as noted by Ms. Licata from DEP and as Council Member Ulrich said earlier, there is already a community-driven task force in the area. Um, and we think that the, the Council's task force could work alongside that and not displace it. That is our that is our goal to to just codify the current uh, task force. Great, that's that's good to hear that. And so we we urge the council to include at least two members from that task force so that there could be cooperation, integration, mm -hmm. and you know what, call up Dan Squared as Councilman Ulrich called him before, and and see how you could best integrate because they had a meeting last week. There were seventy people there. They've got a good thing going. They have community buy-in, and you can translate that to what you're doing here. Um, now on 628, uh, Chairman Constantinidis, I, I really appreciate your words about climate change to kick this meeting off, uh, to kick this hearing off. Um, planning and knowledge sharing for resiliency is essential, especially it's essential to save property and to save lives, uh, especially in low income communities. Um, I probably don't need to read this off because you know this <coughs> better than anybody, but 43 people lost their lives during Sandy. Uh, 51 square miles of New York City flooded. That's 17% of the city. Um, on the flood maps uh, that were put out by FEMA that were in existence at the time, and I, I believe still are, only 33 square miles had advance notice that there would be flooding in those neighborhoods. Um, so we acknowledge that flooding and flood insurance maps have a tremendous financial impact on residents and um, their ability to live there and afford flood insurance, depending on where the line is drawn. Um, but we're, we're concerned that if you draw very conservative flood maps, um, you'll give residents a false sense of security. And what that'll do is make residents more likely to um, shelter in place during a major storm, and it will make them more likely to develop new structures in vulnerable areas, and potentially structures that aren't resilient in, um, for, against climate change. So as part of this bill, we urge the council to uh, inform people of these scientifically based risks, the real risks of flooding, uh, both the current and the future risks, which are way worse. And so we, we would urge you to send maps, send mailers with maps in plain language um, explaining that risk and urging people to get flood insurance, to get covered. Um, if they do get covered now, it's possible they could save money in the long run by grandfathering their rates. Um, so we think that information will be crucial for these communities, even no matter where the lines are drawn by FEMA and the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Richards, do you have any questions? I want to thank you all for your testimony today. We definitely appreciate uh, your input and look forward to working with you as we refine these bills for passage. So thank you. I think the, the music means we're going to Skype in our next witness. <laughs> Hello. All right. So is this William Sweet? Yes, hi. William Sweet here. All right, I don't think we see you, but we can we can hear you. Give us a moment. There you are. All right. Hang on one moment. There he is. All right. All right. So, oh, are we good? I can hear you all. Can we can we can hear you. All right. Great. 
So we would, uh, we're ready to hear your testimony. Ms. Great. Super. Well, I'll, uh, I'll share a, um, a PowerPoint that I have and, and walk you all through it. All right. Is, is it showing up? Yes. Great. All right. Well, I, I will uh, have about 10 slides or so, um, take about 10 minutes and sort of walk you through some of the latest uh, research uh, and applied research that we are doing here at the group I work with in NOAA. Um, so entitled Projections of Sea Level Rise and High Tide Flooding Along the uh, New York City Coastline. So to start, uh, I'm an oceanographer. I work with the a group, uh, the Center for Operational Oceanographic graphic products and services that uh, is under the National Ocean Service in NOAA, and we operate all the tide gauges around the country, and this data provides us information about uh, not only high tide and low tide and are important for shipping, but also how sea levels and uh, flood risk have been changing, and I will um, focus more or less on the, the New York City area. I know you're discussing Jamaica Bay and use the battery tide gauge in some illustrative and quantitative uh, ways. So, uh, as mentioned, uh, we have several tide gauges in the region, one of which here, this is an old photo of, of the gauge at the battery before we moved it. Um, again, we, we measure not only the astronomical tide, but any weather, um, which storm surge, for instance, Hurricane Sandy, we measured that height at our gauge. Uh, and really, I think what's important is what does uh, it high tides and changing high tides at that matter, you know, how does it start affecting and impacting the communities? Uh, so shown here is just a graphical representation of what a time series of data looks like. And I'll actually show some graphics on February 8th and 9th during a nor'easter that you all had to show like what type of flooding um, I'll refer to. Um, so in, in general, minor flooding about two feet above the mean high tide range, moderate more or less three feet, major uh, four feet or more, and I'll focus sort of on the two to three foot range, which we're sort of referring to as sunny day. Um, there may be a localized storm, but more times than not, these types of events are happening from more common tides, common storms, or, or wind events. Maybe they're not local and uh, are starting to spill into the streets. So here would be an example of, of that February time frame. You all know these locations better than I, but the local weather forecast office of the of National Weather Service sort of documents, you know, impacts and where they're happening uh, to sort of give an illustrious example of the types of impacts associated when water levels reach the tide gauge, let's say at two feet or three feet above the mean highest average tide. So very quickly, some pictures when the tide gauge reached these levels. So as you can see, and as I'm sure many of you uh, experienced or witnessed, you know, we're, we're talking about some, you know, fairly consequential uh, uh, storm level, uh, uh, water levels. Um, this obviously occurred during a, a nor'easter, but again, the idea is that we're going to have these common weather events, and we're not talking about the Hurricane Sandys. We're just talking about wind blowing out of the northeast, uh, combining with a, a high, you know, full moon type tide and water is now beginning to spill into the streets more often. So with that, you know, a snapshot, if we'd say sort of where infrastructure is built currently, two feet or three feet above this high tide average, that would be the zero, you know, above the mean high tide, and how the daily highest water levels in, you know, over five year spans have just changed through time. You know, it gives you sort of a sense of, you know, you do have those rare events, there are seasonality, but now more common, year-to-year uh, -year repetitive type of tides and, and uh, weather events are becoming more impactful. Uh, and the way that I think it's been shown, let's say, in the risky business type of documents and just increasing risk is this idea that if these are um, uh, bell-shaped type curves that represent the highest water level, uh, daily water levels in a given year, so about 365 events underneath this curve, it's very nonlinear underneath this curve. You know, through time, sort of decadal um, averages, let's say, due to sea level rise, 
relative to infrastructure, this is that increasing risk. You know, it's a very clear signal of sea level rise, and it's very well documented. So with that, we can say, all right, well, the three-foot floods, the number of days with the three-foot flood, you're sort of outside still the, the curvature of these uh, of these the risk, let's say. But it's increasing, though it's still somewhat rare, maybe once every other year or so over the last couple decades. But when we measure, let's say, the two-foot flood, the number of days now is clearly accelerating. And it's because this, as sea level rises, there's less freeboard or there's less distance between the average tides and, and let's say, a two-foot elevation, which has some consequence. And the number of times, number of days per year is already on an accelerated trajectory. And in time, the three-foot flood will be. And in time, the four feet. But I think what you all are debating is when does that come? And, at, and I use these metrics because you're sort of, we measure them on an annual basis. So it's a little bit different than describing when does the 100-year event become the 10-year event or the one-year event. That's a little bit more difficult because the uncertainty of, of the, these types of event probabilities. The 100-year event isn't very well sampled. The Hurricane Sandy's, it requires dynamical models and all sorts of uh, different ways of, of dynamically or statistically trying to determine what is the one in a 100-year type of event whereas the events that happen on an annual basis are very well sampled. And so really the waiting time as we move to the future, just as we've been documenting from the past, is really about once does that become sort of an annual level event. The uncertainty of that event is, is really not there. You know, on a year-to-year -year basis, the event that happens once a year might vary by just a few centimeters. So it's very repetitive, and it's really about how much sea level rise needs to occur until events now, let's say the three-foot flood, until they start becoming... Uh, very uh, recognizably in the term of a trend, you know, when it becomes 5, 10, 20 days a year kind of thing. So with that in mind, a little background, um, I was given, you know, a few questions that, you know, maybe I could to speak to, to as you all go into your, uh, your deliberation for your proposals. Um, the idea is that, you know, there's going to be a certain assumption, you know, a scenario that you'll plan to, and in this case, um, a, a degree temperature increase. I'm not sure when the underlying uh, annual basis was, is it, you know, pre-industrial or what have you, but it really gets at, um, you know, an increase of somewhere between maybe four and six degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and in, in terms of, of characterizing that, you know, that's sort of the trajectory that uh, uh, the emissions that we're currently on as, and that's been documented by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, is this representative concentration pathways that will then relate to some sea level rise uh, scenario modeling that we've done uh, at NOAA and other agencies and, and academic institutions to provide this information for all the U.S., including the New York City, so to future planning guidance. So those scenarios, um, which we worked with uh, researchers uh, with the USGS, with Rutgers, Columbia universities, we put out a, a study last year that is being included in the National Climate Assessment, the fourth assessment that's ongoing right now, really start looking at you know, I'll talk, to, refer to them as sea level rise by year 2100. There's this low end scenario of 0.3 meters, this low blue line, or it could be as, as extreme as upwards possibly globally of two and a half meters. Very unlikely, but uh, plausible. Um, but we'll focus more on the uh, intermediate low, intermediate, intermediate high. And we'll specifically choose those. And again, if, if I back up, um, those values there were the intermediate low is the medium blue, sort of royal blue, 0.5 meters globally. Intermediate is 1 meter by 2100, and the intermediate high is 1.5 meters by 2100. Again, that's global, and we'll downscale these and then apply that to a coastal flood risk. Um, so, again, the storylines would more or less be, uh, I need to use the intermediate low to really characterize what might happen over the next decade, because that's a little bit more along the lines of the trajectory. But the intermediate low all the way up to the intermediate really sort of characterizes this annual variability that we're experiencing as well as the trend. Um, and the associated storylines with these are uh, the intermediate high is, is pretty much bound sort of a uh, very likely range of sea level rise under the way that we currently are modeling with, with current uh, emissions as, as usual. It could, again, it could be higher than that. But if those types of scenarios were to unfold, it would be likely much later in the century. And so uh, the questions, again, were sort of focused on what 
might happen in the 2020s as well in the 2050s. So these would be sort of the three scenarios that we present. Um, in terms of that global realization of those sea level rise amounts, we also need to account for changes in land elevation. Uh, that region is slowly subsiding, partially due to the, the removal of the Lash glaciers. Um, there's going to be gravitational rotational effects um, due to melting of land-based ice of Greenland and Antarctica. It currently once uh, it actually has exerts a lot of gravitational tug on the water just because of the additional mass there. As that continues to melt, uh, the gravitational attraction will decrease and the water will rise uh, far away from the source of these ice. So we calculate that as well, as well as circulation changes. Slow down of the Gulf Stream system or this overturning circulation and all the models are suggested to uh, cause an additional rise along the, uh, the New England coast. So with that, here's what the scenarios actually look like downscaled for the New York City region and overlaid with annual mean sea level that we've been measuring at the battery. And again, these are very similar to what you would see at Sandy Hook or Bergen Point. Uh, sea level uh, uh, is a fairly coherent um, uh, uh, change, so it, it, the length scales are fairly large. So this is more or less your sort of regional sea level rise. So you can see that if the focus will be on the sort of the cyan, light blue, green, and yellow is sort of the three bounding potentials right now that will uh, project out into 2020 as well into 2050 to give some sense of, you know, what that outcome would be if sea level rises by that amount uh, during those time periods. So with that in mind, um, we'll start with the number of two-foot floods, a uh, number of days per year with a two-foot flood as measured by the tide gauge. Um, already the previous slide I showed you that it was already on an annual uh, flood frequency basis as a, a, a linear, uh, a quadratic or nonlinear increase in these a number of days per year. Um, and this is sort of the continuation, the pink saying, referring just for color contrast here, the pink by no means is to say that it's not a, a, a an important factor just to stand out, but that's currently what's been uh, measured, whereas the, the light blue, the green, and the yellow would represent those three bounding scenarios. And so when you take an average over the 2020s, those are the numbers um, that you would expect the number of days per year. Could be two high tides in a given day, but we're just quantifying days per year. So that would contrast into currently what you're experiencing now would be more or less the lines of six or so if you fit that with your, the quadratic fit trend line of about 2015. So a, a very large increase. Again, this is for a two-foot flood um, above mean higher high water, the highest average tide. If we project that further mid-century, on average during the 2050s, or an average from 2050 to 2060, um, oh, excuse me. Oops, all right, there we are. Can you see the screen? Um, are you still with me? Okay. Um, yes, we're here. We you, can see. Super. Um, when you project out the uh, to 2050s, here's the new numbers. So, again, it's um, characterizing the fact that, again, the repetitive nature of sea levels we very well uh, uh, measured and, and can quantify those. And so really the uncertainty here is not so much on the extreme as how much will mean sea level increase. And so this would be your characterization by mid-century uh, of a two-foot flood. Not as impactful as a three-foot flood, and we'll look at that next. So by definition, the mean high tide line, uh, uh, oftentimes what you'll see in some mapping uh, tools such as the sea level rise viewer, the zero is mean high, high water. By definition, that occurs about 180 days per year. So when you get beyond 180 days per year, you're saying that uh, the, the mean high tide line really will be at two feet. So to put that into perspective. Now, if we look at the a number of days per year with a three foot flood, more impactful, uh, many of those images I showed earlier were uh, closer to a three foot level as, me as measured by the battery tide gauge simultaneously as flooding was occurring. Um, Currently, there's not really an observable trend. It still happens maybe once every other year, so we're not really getting enough instances where it forms a, you know, a clear linear or quadratic increase. Um, but doing the same sort of analysis going into the 2020s, 
um, something that now occurs maybe once every other year on average over the last few decades under you know these three scenarios. Um, for instance, the intermediate high would happen on average seven days per year. Um, the intermediate low maybe one to two days per year, going from something that would happen every other year currently. So if we project that out um, to mid-century in the 2050s, here are the new values. And there are very large difference between the intermediate high and the intermediate low, largely due to that bell-shaped type characterization of sea levels in, uh, in New York City. And that's similar as elsewhere around the country, the, the shape of the bell, the shape curve is slightly different. But uh, again, uh, you're, there's a remaining amount of free board between you know, the, the types of events that cause you know, fairly you know, abnormal flooding of once every other year to something that becomes much more routine. And, uh, you know, projecting under these three scenarios at least gives you some sort of sense of the flood frequencies that are anticipated if sea level would follow suit accordingly. And so we're, we're developing these types of tools to help you track along. Hopefully this is informative in, you know, some of the decision making as to the types of risks that um, may or may not face this region. But to be aware of what... Um, is more likely to unfold under these types of scenarios as, as you plan and move forward. So with that, um, that is the presentation. Um, I will, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those now and I can either uh, go live or, or keep the screens, up, uh, the uh, presentation up. So just uh, definitely appreciate your deep analysis here, Mr. Sweet. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, so what do you think the city could be doing better to sort of stave off some of these large flooding uh, sort of projections? Uh, well, the, I, I don't know so much about staving off. I think ultimately the group you know that I, I work with within NOAA, the forefront is really getting the data into – uh, the decision makers' hands, so they're aware of the patterns that are already ongoing, um, and, and are aware of the, the future risk. You know, on a local uh, entity, you, you know, the, it's, I think it's really customizing your response to what's likely to unfold. You know, oftentimes collectively as a whole, you know, these scenarios do relate back to emission scenarios. But again, uh, not to say that sort of without the reach of a sole entity of one town versus a collective uh, response globally, um, the scenarios, again, being tied to emissions uh, sort of speak to themselves. Uh, you know, I think there's groups within NOAA and, and elsewhere that definitely discuss, you know, as you fortify and defend or come up with mitigative strategies um, to recognize that, you know, you can build with nature or, or, you know, sort of open space design in mind where you afford flood defenses as well as create open space for people to, um, you know, utilize land that uh, otherwise might, you know, be become unaccessible. So to directly to gear you towards giving you guidance, you know, policy type prescriptive guidance isn't directly my, you know, that's not the part of the role that I, I play here, but I think really becoming aware of the change and what looks to be, you know, the types of outcomes in the next several decades under, you know, one or two scenarios, I think ultimately, hopefully will help guide, you know, the decision-making process. So, right. you know, I sort of answer that indirectly as best I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I'm going to turn it over at this point to my colleague, uh, Council Member Stephen Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, very alarming, very concerning, um, horrifying. Um, you know, I, it's it's within a, a lot you know a lot of our lifetimes that uh, we're going to be seeing uh, potentially, you know, half the year under. Um, under three feet of flooding, uh, that's that's uh, uh, horrifying. Um, do you have um, because the you know the trajectory of your data or the, your projections are showing you know this rapid acceleration? Um, do you have the empirical data from the last fifty or seventy-five or a hundred years to show what the um, whether there's been any um, variation? You know prior to the last few years? 
Um, well, I, I think in terms of, I guess you got to, we got to disentangle two things. I guess mean sea level, you know, what is the mean, mean sea level does, as I showed with the earlier tide gauge, um, isn't always a nice, clear, um, you know, curve. Nothing tends to be, uh, follow a nice, simple trajectory. There is that interannual variability. Uh, and as you go back specifically to the New York City area and, and, and the New England for that matter, there are decades where mean sea level rates are, are higher and lower, and it looks as if now, at least on a global basis, it's easier to uh, reconcile global sea level change and make uh, uh, inferences about past decadal uh, rates compared to today's rates. When you're at a local area, there's a lot of variability from other factors of prevailing wind patterns changing to uh, water uh, temperature changes to Gulf Stream influences that are kind of hard to disentangle. So there is evidence that, you know, that sea level rise rates have varied, but the long-term uh, trend is definitely positive, and the, on the current rate of change is statistically um, about in the likely areas of saying that this is different over the last several centuries. In terms of flood risk, you know, then that's another anecdotal or, or evidence of saying, you know, if you talk about, let's say, a hurricane Sandy's or these rare events, um, you know, that sometimes aren't in the tide gauge that I tend to rely more heavily on in these types of presentations. You know, there are sedimentary overwash instances that would say, though we would find Sandy to be quite rare when you start sampling these rare events uh, with a population size of one or two, you need to look elsewhere. And so the sedimentary overwash would suggest suggest that types of sandy level surges have occurred several times in the last several centuries. Uh, so again, there is a, there's patterns and, and cycles uh, that oftentimes compound the trends as we're looking at them, but we're able to generally tease those out. And as we project into the future, I'm really basing this on sort of 20 year kind of averages. So there will be periods where the tide ranges are higher uh, within a 19-year cycle. And so in any given year, it may not be quite as high uh, or it might be higher, but that's why typically, as stated with those averages, I'm sort of making by the end of the, let's say, the, the 2060, it's an average of what will have occurred over the uh, decade prior to sort of give a more conservative estimate. The underlying scenarios themselves are based on 19-year snapshots, working with uh, Bob Kopp and others at Rutgers and, and other uh, modelers their output so again it's not so much it's really trying to characterize the overall state of change and not so much year-to-year -year variability thank you mr sweet again thank you for your work uh, your projections as, as councilman Levin talked about are, are something that we have to take to heart and and do the work and and they are sobering <laughs> so thank you for your efforts we perfectly appreciate it well, thank you. I'm glad to be able to help out, and good luck with your, your decision-making. Thank you. All right, so uh, seeing uh, no other testimony at this time, I want to thank the administration and all those that gave testimony today. I want to thank our uh, uh, staff attorney, our Samara Swanston, uh, our policy analyst, Nadia Johnson, our financial analyst, uh, Johnny and Jonathan Seltzer, uh, we also have Kent, our intern at the end, who's been doing a great job. And, and my uh, Legislative Council, Nick Wazowski, at this time we will gavel close this meeting of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Thank you.